greetings, greetings. How are we? Welcome along to today's edition, Inspire and Be Inspired. Uh, everything's going absolutely wrong, as you would expect, technically, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. My name is Andy Ward, and every Tuesday evening, I get into conversation with legends in the game uh, from either the music industry or uh, business or whatever. And tonight, we have definitely got two legends in the game. Uh, as you can see, Colin Curtis and Neil Rushton are the third in a series of interviews. I am calling Brum as fuck. Excuse the profanity, but that's the way it is. Uh, without further ado, I am going to go to these two gentlemen who should be with me live on the screen. Good evening, gentlemen. Good afternoon. How are you? All right. I'm, How are you all right. I'm good. I'm very good. I spend hours tweaking things trying to get all of this technology to work press little buttons to fire a video to uh automatically mute my microphone change the screen as soon as we go live it all decides to pack up on me so uh but we're all rocking and rolling the important thing is i'm on the screen you guys are on the screen and we have got uh hopefully over the course of however long it takes uh the very difficult task of you sharing your words as to why you believe Birmingham is extremely important in the music scene and particularly the house music scene in the UK. Uh, I'm sure both of you guys really don't need to be introduced to our viewers uh, who are with us live and also picking up the recording. So again, I'd like to thank you both for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with me. Uh, and I'm not ashamed to say, it takes a lot for me to feel nervous when I'm being interviewed by people, but uh, I feel I, uh, I'm in the presence of greatness here, guys. So I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous. So please be gentle with me. <laughs> yeah. Where, where do we begin? So first of all, let me start with Colin, because as we were here, that is not a Birmingham accent. So how are you qualified to talk about our beloved second city as being influential and important on the music map? Um, well, I, I, I connected with Birmingham uh, as, as a kid because uh, my father hated two places uh, when he drove around. He hated uh, Birmingham and he hated Chester because they got two of the most difficult um, roads to negotiate through the city and he'd always get lost every time, come out in a rash. And, um, you know, so, so that was, I, 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 that, that drew me to Birmingham initially. But uh, as a kid, I, I, I drove there in 19, it would have been about 1969, uh, on the promise of a, of a DJ job uh, at, at a club that apparently had a galleon inside it. And uh, it was a very, very foggy day. In fact, it took us over two hours to get from Stoke to Birmingham, a, a kind of 45, 50 minute run normally, um, even in those days. And um, we never found the club. But what I did find was um, record shops. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, the same way. The same way I'd found record shops in Manchester when I first found spinning. But you found Discovery, um, and you know later on, uh, drawn back to Birmingham through record shops, really through uh, another pioneer from from the area, and that's Mr. Graham War, who used to run a shop in the Oasis complex. I was always fascinated by the Oasis. You know this this you know tunnel. Of, of, of what were like catacombs, I mean, all linked together and, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of shops tucked away in this place. But I, I was just completely sold on it. Graham War spoke my language. He was interested in getting new music into the shop. Uh, you know, and I got to know Graham, you know, through, through, through his Northern Soul connections. And he had one of the most successful Northern Soul trips um, of all time. Uh, finding some of the, you know, the greatest Northern Soul records. He was connected with the catacombs. So we got on like a house on fire. I've still got the check stubs that I used to give him. You know, the checks had taken about three weeks to go through, oh. but Graham put up with that. And um, it, for me, it was it, it became an essential part. And and as 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 time progressed, and with girlfriends, I mean, Birmingham was always a great place to go. You got your know, bus stop, uh, you got Wallace, all these fantastic fashion shops. There was a connection with with 
music, a connection with fashion. Not that I'm an, a fashion aficionado, but in those days, um, local clothes shops used to kind of sponsor me by giving me you know different clothes to wear. Uh, looking back at, at, at some of the photographs, I'm glad that most of the photographs never came out. Uh, and and you know, photographs in those days were, were, were something that was you know on the list probably probably before food, but uh, you know well down the list. But um, yeah, I, I, it just grew. It became an essential part, uh, you know, an essential city for me to go. And then um, my local friend Bob Morris who was a collector of 45s back in those days, um, came back, uh, came into in, into the club one night in Tiffany's with a, a record by, uh, I've only got myself to blame on, on Shaw Shop. And I asked him where he got it from. He said he picked it up in Reddington's in Birmingham from the kiosk. And so I then discovered the kiosk at Reddington's. I, I discovered Reddington's records. And yeah, it, it, Years later, you know, from the jazz point of view, discery, uh, jazz and swing. I used to go to jazz and swing and give them two or three hundred pounds, and then they locked me in the shop next door, which wasn't used as retail, just as a storeroom. Oh. But the great thing about those guys was that they give me a cup of tea and lock me away for about four or five hours. But the great thing about those guys is whatever I bought and took away that day, next time I came. They had a pile of albums ready for me based on the artists and the players that were on those albums. Mm -hmm. So they were absolutely fantastic help. And, and, you know, just it was just a joy to go uh, to a record shop like that. And um, well, Birmingham, yeah, drew me the shopping, the Oasis, Graham War in those days. Uh, and, and eventually, of course, um, I was booked to DJ at the Lacona. Um, but the, the club that hit me in the jazz funk era would have been Chaplin's. Chaplin's and Graham War um, and the dancers turned out to be a historical mm -hmm. moment in time in terms of club culture. Well, we had a great conversation with Frenchy and Bruce Q, who also echoed a lot of those uh, memories that you were talking about. So, Mr. Rushton, a lot of uh, names, places, um, moments that you'll also relate to tell us your your slant on it i guess you would have been running parallel with that story right well i was a brummy i like colin so i was born in harbour and i lived in Whirley castle um bartley green longbridge and then i, I moved like lots of people we moved from birmingham to outline areas i was moved to palson near warsaw when i was 10 and um but always my, my relatives, were, my grandparents were in Birmingham, so I used to go to Birmingham all the time. And then obviously I used to go to the football every week. And then the way the, the music developed, obviously I was going to go out in Birmingham, but because I moved to Palsall, it was kind of weird. I was a Brummie, but I was exposed to this underground rare soul movement, which, you know, years later got called Northern Soul. So um, I lived near Warsaw, and Warsaw had a place called the George Hotel where a guy called Cole Dean had been resident at the Chateau Whitney and um, Catacombs was there. So we, that was our education. And so my, my whole thing was, yeah, I'd go to Barbarella's, I'd go to gigs and so on. I'd, been, I'd go to town all the time. I'd go to the Blues for every, every, every home game. But my music journey was, was, wasn't, was, was, was basically around First Civil World, everywhere apart from Birmingham, so the West Midlands. And the main club for me at the time was the, um, the Catacombs in Wolverhampton. But going back to what I, I became a DJ there towards the end of the spell, they're very much a junior DJ. So put but, a date uh, on that for me, just for my own small mind, roughly. Like the, the a date. Yeah. Now, I, it closed in 74. I was there for the last six months. Okay. And then Graham War, who is a hero of mine, as well as Errol Collins, he was there from around 67. And um, Graham went on two or three record trips to America. And... Um, he basically found a lot of records. I mean, a lot in Miami, first of all, then Philly, uh, Chicago, and um, he was like the trailblazer. So um, Graham was the I, I, Wolverhampton guy, but then he ended up at, um, at the Oasis, and I became uh, a staff writer. I actually was based in London, went for Black Echoes. If you look at the first six months of Black Echoes, the record reviews were by Gra from Graham Wall Shop in the Oasis. But Graham was so <laughs> tight. I had to get there on a Saturday and basically write my reviews in the shop. I'd say, can I just bring them back or post them to you on the Wednesday? No, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't want to buy all of them. So some of the reviews are probably awful. You know, I literally, Saturday morning at the Oasis, I'd be 
little pen and paper. Can you play the Ben Graham? No, I want to sell some records to somebody else. So, and then also um, Birmingham Connection, um, Chaplin's to me was like the ultimate place and preparing for this interview. I was trying to work out if I went there every Friday or just occasionally. I think it was, it went a lot. And um, it, to me, it was just magical. It was small. And because it was, you know, it's like, it's a small room if you're a DJ, you can impose your views, can't you as a DJ? You haven't got to, you know, it's, it's a Graham used to play stuff like New Birth and Jeff Lorber, Samba records. And, and of course he had the shop and he had brilliant ears. So he'd get records in on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, and he'd play them that Friday. And um, so it was perfect. And he, he could never enter the dance floor because the dance floor was so small. Everyone was so hungry for the music. So I think that that really was an important club for Birmingham. So a legacy built before the likes of myself, a young whippersnapper came along. It's it's really quite daunting, yeah, well, if, if that's the right well, way well, to, to hear the history. Towards people like Lee Fisher, just going towards the house scene, Graham and Julie were around on the house scene, weren't they, as punters? Yeah. And they used to have some parties at the house. And Lee Fisher, until I spoke, didn't, didn't realise for two years that Graham had any history at all, apart from being a... Just a fan of house music, it never never boasted or never talked about. Never. Well, all. the thing is, no. my my knowledge of Graham, I used to see him at the Marco Polo on a Sunday morning yeah. after a very long weekend. So uh, both him and Julie would be slightly worse for wear uh, on occasions. Uh, yeah. And a, a few, many years older than us guys at the time who were in our early 20s. Uh, and I remember thinking... Eventually, I got to know him. Eventually, I got to know him. I, I used to think, who is this geezer? Didn't really yeah. give him the respect that he obviously deserved. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, it's, so it's, all these it's, years it's later, it's crazy. Because Graham's not publicity man, you know? But if, if if you can get him, well, he loves to talk. But I mean, he's not desperate for publicity. He doesn't need the oxygen of publicity or fame. But if you get to talk to him, his contribution and what he did was amazing, you know? Mm-hmm. And then going back to me, I mean, the 70s, I, 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 start, I, was, I was promoting events. My main venue was the, uh, the Ritz in Manchester, which Colin was a resident DJ. That, that to me was like probably the most important all day in the history of the early days of Jazz One, because I was a Northern Soul venue. I mean, Northern Soul was second only to Wing Casino as far as what we, the, the, the events were on. And from that, I did Blackpool Mecca, like up to 3,000 people. Again, Colin was one of the DJs, groups like Crown Nights Affair, Brass Construction. Sylvester, Allison and the Soul Partners, just a pretty magical time. But I was desperately trying to do gigs in Birmingham. I did a few, I promoted a few all day as uh, Hard to Be Soul at the Locarno. And for some reason, it never worked for me. And then I think Colin will, uh, yeah, Colin probably knows some of the politics of this. Uh, I, I, there was something going on where the, the Midlands management, even though I was the golden boy and I was only 21 when I started Ritz, so I was young, that they let me do anything. But I couldn't get into, I couldn't get into the place. I did three or four. It didn't take off, and then when it took off, it was brilliant. And you had the ballet idea, the jazz one. I was so jealous because I, you know, apart from the fact I could have made lots of money, but I mean, it would have been a natural thing for me to have the Ritz in Manchester and the Burning Lacona. I did, um, did around me on Juliet, it was literally opposite there. I did an all nighter there one time, I think Colin might have been on, where we basically just gave flyers away, uh, in, in the uh, Locarno to the people, they went to the all nighter, and we didn't know if it was going to be a bigger jazz funk room or a northern soul room. And uh, I think we changed the rooms around four times between like 12 yeah, o'clock did, and one. We did, we did, we did. I, I, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was amazing, literally, wasn't it? Literally across the road, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 remember, I remember arriving and you, and you weren't sure which room I was going to be in because you hadn't decided what was happening. No, I remember that, yes. But um, the, the Locarno and, and the politics, there, there, was, there was politics within Mecca as well as politics within the scene. But eventually, uh, Terry Sampson and, and Chris King got, got the car um, lifted. But, I mean, originally, that was Northern Soul in the main room at the Locarno, Jazz Funk in the back room, um, and that was it. No, but when uh, I started, but, uh, Colin, when I started, there was no such thing as Jazz Funk. I'm talking about when I was doing the early days, the Ritz 75. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm calling it Jazz Funk because there was nothing else to call it. In the back right. room... We, uh, we were playing we were playing new releases basically uh i don't think jazz funk had got a title if you look back at some of the uh the rafters flyers in manchester from that particular time we, we changed the name of what what the scene was called almost every week because it didn't have a name Yet we used the we spelt the, the the name funk off the slave album yeah. oh 
we've lost Colin. It's yeah. frozen. It will catch up. It will catch up in a second. Uh, I while Colin is frozen, maybe uh, he'll have to disconnect and reconnect. Uh, as you can see, we are deep in conversation with these two legends. So forgive me if I don't immediately get to say hi to you guys that are watching us. Uh, I will read all of your comments and I will ask the guys your, your questions. So th thank you for being here. Sorry, Colin, we lost you briefly there. Start again from wherever you feel you began that point. I think you were talking about well, the just, politics. Just, just talk, yeah, talking about the Locarno, you know, N N Neil, uh, as he says, uh, I mean, Neil, had carte blanche, um, uh, you know, in Manchester and, and in Blackpool with Mecca organization. But Mecca organization was like any other organization. And there was people who were making decisions. And, and, and I think once some people saw the opportunity to, 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 to make names for themselves, uh, the politics entered it. And, uh, Terry Sampson and Chris King, they started that, you know, Northern Soul was, was, was the mainstay in that initially. Um, and then what became the Jazz Funk Room. But as time went by, uh, Locarno changed to the powerhouse and, and the main room became, you know, brand new music, Washington Go-Go. I mean, we were introducing people like Westwood for hip hop. We were introducing Paul Trouble Anderson who played Go-Go. The back room then became just a jazz room um, with the likes of Chris Reed. Um, you know, the, the original DJs in that back room, Sean Williams and Dave Till, who both worked uh, at the Rum Runner, um, you know, but the, the, the Northern Soul had been uh, had been uh, relegated to the third room, which is just as you entered the building, a small room, probably only 150 people, although there wasn't even 150 people in there sometimes. And 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 the main room in the powerhouse had become, you know, a mixture of, uh, you know, the end of jazz funk, electro, uh, the beginning of house with records like Harlequin Fours. Um, and the back room, as I say, had become a specific jazz dance room, which reflected really the fact that that whole jazz dance movement had started in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. It had started the way people danced had started at Chaplin's. Well, you say talking about dancers, Stephen Seymour, a very good friend of mine, family friend, uh, one of those original dancers that would have been there back in the day, saying uh, music legends, telling it like it was. So giving you a lot of props. Uh, also, hi to Fernando, another great dancer as well. Uh, would you say when the Locarno changed over to the Powerhouse, there were, um, were there ever any <sighs> rumblings that it was getting a little bit too uh, popular at any time? Because the music was becoming a little bit more mainstream for a little while, wasn't it? Because now we're starting to talk about an era that I can briefly uh, have some knowledge of because I was just starting to go about that at the time, I think. When, when, when you say mainstream, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think the music was becoming mainstream. I think the popularity of the records was was probably crossing to a bigger audience. Right. I don't think it was considered mainstream because, you know, we we were, we were still playing very very upfront music. I mean, one one of the moments that I would say connected with commerciality with with the powerhouse was when um, uh, was it Malcolm McDonald released uh, Buffalo. Malcolm McLaren. Malcolm McLaren. Malcolm McLaren, yeah. Well, when he released that, I remember coming. I'd come come from another gig, and I arrived oh. at uh, the powerhouse on this particular day. And the powerhouse had videos, video yeah, streaming. All, I, was all there, I was there. I was there that day. That video was shown all the time, wasn't it? The video was showing all the time, and the kids, the kids who were very fashionable in there, were absolutely glued to this. And 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 for me, that was like, wow, why? Why? Because you know, this music that we're playing is much better than that music. But it wasn't the music. What what they were reacting to was the fashion and 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 the, I suppose the cool, the hipness of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Malcolm McLaren thing, and that affected the fashion greatly. With that, I mean, you know, Neil Neil did the Ritz, which was an introduction of fashion. Blackpool Mecca, which I was resident at, was very much about fashion. Birmingham as a city was always about fashion, and and you know, right from Lance. Um, as you say, Stephen Seymour, Rick and Ty Hassel, the Baptist Twins, you know, all those early dancers. Um, and, and then when individual dancers, you know, I mean, people like Smiler, people like Baz for Jazz started his career on the dance floor in the Locarno at Birmingham. Um, you know, and Paul Murphy, I mean, he was, he was the first London jazz DJ we brought there. As I say, we had Tim Westwood, we had Paul Trouble Anderson. It, it became 
really, as you say, probably not not as underground because it was so bloody popular, but it it, it wasn't commercial. No, not commercial. I, well, I'll I'll, I'll 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 quote I'll quote you somebody who went on to make a couple of bob, who came up to have a look at the venue, and that was a guy called Pete Tong, and on his way out, he said, Colin. I really enjoyed it, but it's too heavy for me here. And you know what? He's absolutely right, because as a DJ, I would say to anybody, if you can go to Birmingham and succeed, then you can succeed anywhere. Ah, it warms my heart. It warms my heart to hear these stories. So uh, we will come backwards and forwards. At what point did your... Um, love affair with Birmingham come to an end, Colin, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because eventually the the scene would break out into the full-on uh, rave scene towards the back end of the, the 80s. Were you still regularly um, playing in and around uh, Birmingham well, then? The, 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 the period we go to probably is about 85, 86, when, okay. when you saw the musical change. Uh, we, we, there were so many all dayers uh, at that time. There was all dayers in Nottingham, at, uh, originally at the Palais, but eventually at Rock City, which you know, the period we're talking about would have been Rock City. Uh, 1,500 people on a Friday, 2,000 plus at the all dayers. As Neil says, you know, it's similar to the... Uh, uh, to, to Neil's original su successful old days, and then you've got Birmingham Powerhouse, you've got Rock City, but things started to change. The music started to change. We went from, uh, you know, the, the beginnings of, of Sal Soul and, and and Tina Marie. Then we moved into uh, hip hop. We moved into electro. So from the electro point of view, you know, all of a sudden you've got Al Nafish, you've got uh, you know the beginnings of house, as I say, with with the uh, World Column on Easy Street. Um, you've got it, 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 remembering it at sixty eight years old. Sometimes it, it pulls me away. But I mean, it, 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 it was such a mixture of music and, and things starting to change, and the old days kind of phased out by about eighty six. Okay, so let me let me ask one two, two questions based on uh, comments you made there. First of all. I always remember going to Sheffield once or twice. Uh, what was the the old there at Sheffield called? That they, they used to be in a town yeah, hall, yeah. I believe. Was it Jive yeah. Turkey? Jive Turkey, yes. Well, Win Winston, Winston who ran, who ran Jive Turkey was 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 one of my most regular uh, visitors when I started to play house in Manchester, and and you, I don't care what anybody says, oh. nobody played house before me in Manchester, and that was at the Playpen Club, and he was there. Uh, each and every time, and there's a couple of pictures of his friends that, that, that have survived from that time. Um, but he took that idea again in, in, in those years, sort of 86 onwards, uh, Jive Turkey started. When I played at Jive Turkey, I was becoming quite seriously ill, uh, and I was also not as connected as, as I would be musically because you know, the, the weekly connected gigs had started to phase out and they took advantage of that and they opened it up a lot more, opened up the music a lot more, but still had a, a kind of bespoke jazz funk jazz room in, in, in that venue. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, Sheffield, Huddersfield, Leeds, Nottingham, Birmingham, Manchester, you know, that, that was, that was the trip. I mean, and for a short while, I mean, Scotland was on, on the agenda as well. Um, you know, I, I must have played six or seven cities in, in Scotland at the peak of the jazz funk scene. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... so yeah, the... it, 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 Jive, Jive Turkey was, was in that kind of gap, shall we say, uh, sort of 86 to, towards the end of the 80s, yeah. Yeah, that, that was when I was, I would have been 15, 16, started jumping on the coaches myself. So this will lead us, Neil, the demise, if that's the right word, of, and the change of the guard, so to speak, would have been where you were pretty much at the forefront with the change in the sound. Uh, is, is that a fair uh, observation? Well, to be fair, I was, I was out of it for a long, long time. I mean, I was always buying records. I always knew what the big records were, but I wasn't going to Rock City and everything. What happened to me was I went back to my original job as a newspaper reporter, and I loved that job, and I wanted to work in a national newspaper, and I did some shifts in London. So I loved that all that. I was I was still releasing records and and learning and, and, and with local various things going on, and um, and I was I'm trying to think how it all came together. I was frustrated at work. I did a story about uh, the Band Aid single. 
And uh, I was the one who broke the fact that the VAT went to the government. <laughs> and I didn't even get a bar on the. I worked for the Expresses. I always went for the Evening Mail. I thought, that's it. I've had enough of this. And I thought, I want to I want to go back into doing music. And then in the late 70s, as well as working for Black Echoes, as well as DJing and um, promoting events, I'd started a record label called Inferno. And we told things that we, we put some great records out. Gilson Heron, Brian Jackson, The Bottle, and Sexton, Frank Beverly and The Butlers, and some real oldies like Frida Payne, Band of the Gold, that sold 40,000. So... I knew I knew a little bit about how record labels worked about just, just a distribution. Bit. Forty thousand would have got you to number one nowadays. <laughs> yeah, around the world, I know, I know. And and um, so so when the house when the embryonic house thing happened, I was really into it, and I, I loved the records. And um, along with Dave Barker, it was really Pat Ward's mate. You you know Pat and they don't you know what I mean he now runs KRD Distribution. Uh, we started a record label called Cool Cat, and it was completely insane. I, 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 had, I, uh, I had a fairly expensive mortgage, uh, a wife who wasn't too keen about it, two kids, and I just said, I'm going to do this. And um, so I left my job in 86. It is about the music, not about me, because of what was going on with this, I just said, the changeover. And um, let me think. Now, the music was, the house music was pl played 85, 86, the early stuff. I left my job in 87. And we started Cool Cat. And the Birmingham Connection there was our first record was Risky Business, which was Paul Dixon and uh, Scooby Swift. And we were licensing stuff, but also releasing stuff like Lies, who were Midlands guys. Um, that, that was licensed to Virgin. T -Kid F, who was Mark Gamble, that was licensed to Virgin. And um, what happened was I realised that we were really in trouble because people like Pete Tong, they got the whole market sewn up. And Damon DeCruz at Jack Tracks, I mean, he had Chicago written sewn up. I remember listening to um, Mr. Fingers, Can You Feel It? Thinking, oh my God, what an amazing record. But we, 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 you know, we couldn't get anywhere near those labels. And then what happened was I started listening to records from Detroit, uh, partly, be, well, initially, I guess, because I love Detroit soul music. And that's how I hooked into what became Detroit Techno. So uh, records like Goodbye Kiss, Eddie Fouts, Blake Buxton we used to play, Let's Go X-Ray, and of course Derek made the dance. And I uh, basically, uh, we had this label, which, not, you know, we were releasing some good records actually, but we uh, things, but we were, you know, we, we, were, we, we were so far off having success. And I um, rang up Derek and said, um, I am who I am, you are you are, and uh, I'd love to work with you. And I actually thought, you know, he'd, he'd have like a massive management and a big corporate setup. And it was just Derek and his dog living in, in a house uh, and a pretty pad area just off Eight Mile in Detroit. And Derek came to my house in Burnwood, uh, Christmas 87. <laughs> and from yeah. that, uh, he said, you should work with my friend Kevin Saunderson. And Kevin and, and Derek did three remixes. One was in Birmingham. What, I think it was Zella Studio, which was I'm Tired of Being Pushed Around, uh, which was the... Um, Find Your Cannibals pseudo group. That was by John Mostyn, who I ended up working with. And that was a funny story, Andy, because um, I rang up Zeller and said, uh, we need a Roland 303 and an 808 drum machine. And the guy says, oh, yeah, I rang up. He says, yeah, we got one of them. I said, no, I need both. He says, no, you can't need both. Said, no, we need both, because the guy's <laughs> going to use both and mix the sound up. And, and he didn't believe me. I said, well, we either get us the stuff or we can't do it. Uh, uh, Derek Mix Bang the Party, um, Release Your Body, uh, at um, Addis Ababa Studio, Harrow Road, next to Virgin, which was like one of the great British house records. And he did um, a remix of House Reaction to EKF. Uh, Mark, the guy, Mark Gamble, as I say, and Mark, one of my friends to this day. And I took the House Reaction record, had been signed to Mick Clark at Virgin Records. Mick Clark, as you know, kind of was one of the London Jazz Funk guys. And I, took, I looked up with him. And I took the Derek May remix, and he loved it. And I said, there's, there's, there's actually a whole crew of people here. Uh, Kevin Saunderson, Juan Atkins, Derek May, and I've hooked up with Derek and Juan, Derek and Kevin, and I've got an idea like, will you give me the money for me to uh, go and do a compile on an album? But it wasn't me being paid as a compilation. They paid me to license the record to me, and they're licensing on. It was just the most perfect deal ever. And um, of course, from that, I'm in Detroit, and I ended up here in Big Fun for the first time. And that, I think Derek had made, Kevin had made it a year before and wasn't going to release it. Uh, for a work when he had no real plans. And then that changed my life, really, and then good life and so on. And um, from that, Birmingham became House Music Central because we had the network records, first of all, in Bishop Street, and then at the Great Office in Camp Hill. And we just took off. And um, because John Mossin 
had some great connections with the business. We got publishing deals and the, we did deals with Jazz Summers and Big Life and was licensing records to Pete Tong, to Chrysalis, to Jive. And um, in the city, obviously, we're massively successful. They became the biggest house group in the world. But then Network, we became probably the most successful house label in Europe and in 1992, as well as releasing some real underground stuff, underground resistance, for green dogs from out of space, all kinds of things. Um, we we that, yeah we did, had a lot of chances, that, so we actually did sold more. With, did that tie in with Southport Weekend as well. I, I remember you telling me a story about the you know Kevin Saunders. They slept on your floor, if I remember, and uh, they also were very pleased that they got some leather coats from London. That was the most exciting thing about the trip to Europe for them, it, you know, because obviously they'd already got the musical talent. The, the excitement was there. But yeah, I remember. No, I remember. I think, you know, I think the, Derek slept on the, the early, I, I, the early Southport. The early Southport all day, as I mean, when things were really buzzing for you. Yeah, well, I think that you're talking about the fashion thing, but I think uh, Derek May was, was really pleased. He, he got a uh, leather coat in Birmingham. He loved it. <laughs> he took it back to Holiday in Birmingham. He was delighted. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Southport, I'm trying to think. It's Southport. Um, it's funny enough, we didn't really have much success at Southport. I mean, the Reese Project, which I loved, I mean, I just thought it was the most wonderful thing ever. It was based on Sounds of Blackness of Pressure. Then we got Mike Banks involved and Rachel Cap, and we did a few gigs at, at Birmingham and including Snobs. But we did Southport and Wenger. I thought this would be like the ultimate meeting of the minds and everyone went, oh, so what? It's all right. Oh, okay. You might have been DJ and then I actually, but you know, that, that weekend. But no, so, so, but I mean, overall, I mean, Birmingham, you know, became, we, we were very aggressive uh, at pushing the fact that we weren't from London, you know? Because I resented the fact that the London music industry was full of itself, so London centric, and also it worked to our advantage because we had um, Love Revolution, War Rampton, Rhythmatic from Nottingham, um, Forge Masters from Sheffield. In the end, uh, everybody, you know, and it, it, it became um, great. And we had we had um, things. We're independent label. We sold out to Sony eventually, but uh, our our attitude. I don't want to put tensions, but we had Trevor Jackson doing the artwork, so our artwork was as good as say four from Broadway before. John McCree did our press. John was writing for the face. He was the best writer on the face. So our our press releases were better than anyone else's. And of course, all that's over about you have the music. So I was suddenly coming up with every week a new Model 500 record or a new, I don't know, um, E Dancer or um, Reese Project. So, and, and then the, the old Detroit thing just got great because I did the second album where there was a whole new school. There was Carl Craig, Octave One, MK. Just incredible time, you know. It happened so quickly for me packing my job up. Mm -hmm. So. I actually played an MK record on my radio show at the weekend and, and I commented and I said, every time I play something from MK, he's one of those artists that he would have never, ever really envisaged the the status he would have attained. I, I think he caught a lot of people by surprise years down the line, right? Well, yeah. I mean, when I, when I, got big, when I was at Susu, which was, what, early 2000s, I, I went to went, went to music conference. It was when we had the... Um, the Joey Negro remix of Backfired and also October One, Blackwater. Mm -hmm. We had the two big, you know, we had two really big records. And Mark came out, I hadn't seen Mark for like 10 years. And at the time, he'd been out, he'd been out of the game for a while. He, he really wasn't fashionable at all. And we, I'd got him to do a remix of Rosie Gaines, Closer Than Close. One of the few remixes he'd been asked to do. With. So somebody Mark, else did a remix of that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, pardon? <laughs> I think someone else did a remix of that. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, <laughs> But, but Mark had been out, out of the game, and I think originally hadn't he, been, he went from Detroit to LA, and Quincy Jones adopted him. But well, okay. might have been afterwards. But the, the the old thing of MK becoming this superstar DJ and so on. I mean, it, it didn't happen first time around. But I, I mean, I I sort of spent a lot of time in Detroit watching them all, and he was just a complete genius. You know, I mean, he was like, well, I mean, because the second release on Network was somebody new MK. I mean, our first two releases they couldn't be bad. Neil Howard Indulge from Chicago, and MK, somebody new. I mean, n not a bad way to start a label. In indeed. Uh, just blown away. And Colin, you would have been there supporting these back in the day, uh, working closely with yeah, Neil, I, right? I mean, you, you, you've, you've just hit on, a, a, you know, 86, as I say, the demise of, uh, of the old day scene. I went back into uh, into Manchester um, and and I got a new plan. I got a new plan in my head 
that I wanted things to return a little bit, as opposed to going down one avenue, you know, whether it was hip hop or whether it was house, I wanted to do a night where I DJed not just for alternate hours or for two hours, but where I DJed all night. Uh, this involved carrying heavy crates, which was never popular with all the people who traveled with me because they had to do it. But I started a club in Manchester called Berlin. And the idea here was to reintroduce the jazz that had started for me in Birmingham. The, the, not, jazz itself didn't start for me in Birmingham, but, but the reaction uh, you know, to see its, its potential on, on the dance floor started in Birmingham in Chaplains. And then to be able to take that to, you know, to the old day scene and create jazz rooms up and down the country, and then to go back in, it'd be about 85, 86 to Berlin in Manchester. And our regular customers in those days were Mick Hucknall. You would find Mick Hucknall singing in the toilets, um, uh, you know, fully suited up with his walking stick, uh, trying to emulate Luther Vandross, because uh, we'd play Vandross on the night. Uh, but I also introduced a lot of Brazilian music. I was very lucky at that time. Um, the, the early uh, Mike Pickering bands, Quando Quando, used to come down. You know, a lot of the Manchester bands would come down. This was a Tuesday night in Manchester. Um, and Thompson Twins, uh, when Mays were in town, they came down. Unfortunately, not Frankie Beverly, but Mays came down. Uh, and, you know, if there's anybody playing in town, they would come down. And this night developed through jazz, uh, you know, bringing in Brazilian jazz, bringing in stambas, bringing in that. On the same night, you may hear Africa Bambata. On the same night, you may hear the controllers. Uh, you know, it was a real mixture of people. The early night was very much about the jazz, though, and that, I think, introduced, you know, to, be, to have guys who were Rasta guys, reggae guys, coming up and asking me for tapes of jazz was a real breakthrough again. So this really got me at it again. And, and sort of 86, I was called by the showstopper organization who ran the case to weekend as they were doing something in Bognor. Um, ironically, of course, Southport now goes back to Bognor and I'll be involved in that as well. And thankfully with jazz, but um, this was 86. So at this weekend, uh, the band playing live were clear and Chris Hill stood and listened to my whole set. Chris Hill was the biggest DJ in London at this time. He listened to my whole set, which was a, basically the musical change that Neil's talked about, the, the change towards tracks, you know, the Marshall Jeffersons. And of course, this was kind of, people used to frown upon change. So, you know, he, he wasn't sure if that was the direction that, he, you know, that they wanted to go. I did the jazz room that weekend. I did a radio show with Giles Peterson. Giles Peterson had originally turned up at my club in Berlin. That was the first time I met him. He looked about 12 years old. Um, and the reason he'd come because his best friend, was at university in Manchester, a guy called Andrew. And Andrew used to write down what I played on a cigarette packet and then read it down the phone to Giles on the next morning. And mm -hmm. you know, me and Giles go back a long way and, and, and it's great to be back working with him on Worldwide FM. You know, he's, he, he gave me a new lease of life with that show the last 18 months. But um, yeah, he used to come up to Manchester and then he, you know, he looked into the Manchester scene at that time as well. You know, even, even after Berlin, you, using you know great Manchester DJs like you and Clark, and you've know, seen that sort of street soul develop scene. Uh, the way Manchester, like Birmingham, had got this culture on on every level. You mm -hmm. know, musical culture on every every level, and and open minded. When you look at the the complicated house scene in in Birmingham, you know the knowledge whether it's tech, no matter what style of house it is, that the knowledge in Birmingham is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the events that have happened with, you know, you know better than me, the Custard Factory and all these other places, uh, you know, the same way that, you know, the whole house thing developed. But I, I, I kind of kept the house thing within the soul remit. I never became an out-and-out -out house DJ. I play house all the time. I love it. Because, as Neil said, the connection with Chicago was incredible. I mean, at that weekend, that, that weekend at Bognor in 86, a lot of things happened. Paul Oakenfold came into my chalet to ask if he could look through my record boxes after hearing the set I'd played. And that was early house. That was Precision Label, Grant, and, and you know, records like that, records mm -hmm. on DJ International. That was Paul Oakenfold. Giles Peterson, as I said, did the radio show with. Alex Lowe's came up to me, I think, on the second day there. And he said, Colin, he said, when I go back home, I'm going to start doing weekenders. And the guys whose names 
forgive me guys, whose names escaped me, came to me and said, did I think that the people up the north would come to Ibiza? And I said, we tried to do a weekend in Margate. They wouldn't go there. So they weren't certainly <laughs> going to go to Ibiza. <laughs> So, you Fantastic. know, I mean, the bus there to Margate was out of the question. You know, mm. I mean, obviously, for people in London, the, the airports is second nature. For Manchester, it was a slightly different thing. And Birmingham, probably the same. But I couldn't endorse that. You know, thinking back now, you know, Alex Alex went and did his first weekend in Berwick. And um, I, I was ill at the time. As I say, that, that period for me, 86, 87, was a tough time. But um, I missed that one. But the second one was the, the Caligran Weekender, which was just a holiday camp with um, with Caliban's, some terrible Caliban's. Um, but he, you know, he brought over some incredible acts. All of a sudden, we had Leroy Hudson in front of us. We had um, just just phenomenal live acts. Will Downing came there, you know, and, and Willie Hutch. All, all these fantastic artists uh, started to come into the Weekender and I think he did two or three at, at Caligram before moving to, I think it was Butlins in Morecambe before eventually moving to Southport. Right. After, after the first weekend at Caligram, at the end of the weekend, I was stood with him and Jonathan Woodliffe from uh, Rock City. And he then had to go back. He'd lost that much money. He had to go back home and, you know, borrow money to pay the bills. Uh, that's where it was at that particular point with, with, with Southport. And uh, again, I spoke to Alex the other day. I mean, it, it's great that Southport is back up and running. But Alex is, Alex had the, the same vision as Neil. It, Neil might claim it wasn't a vision, but he had the same open-minded attitude. And, and when he realised that Southport Weekend was becoming this phenomenon, instead of trying to deal with it himself, he, he used a masterstroke and he put, individual people in charge of each room. Yeah. So then in the influx of American DJs, the influx of, of uh, who was the guy from San Francisco, Miguel Miggs, mm -hmm. you know, bringing in people like that and mixing that up, mixing up uh, uh, Moody Man with Giles Peterson, you know, you still got the jazz thing going on there. It was just, just phenomenal. That same feeling I got at the Manchester Ritz, that same feeling I got at the Golden Torch, you know, no matter what the phase of music was, for me, I've been lucky enough to be involved in so many magical moments. But, I mean, in those early days, once they change in the DJs, in comes Masters at Work, in comes, you know, these incredible DJs, Terry Hunter, you know, incredible American DJs coming into that scenario. And, and, and Alex Lowe's, like Neil, just a working-class guy mm -hmm. who, who, who somehow... Uh, utilized the vision and um, you know but that particular weekend in 86 yeah that 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 opened up so many doors for so many people and I thank Showstopper because they never booked me again I, I did inquire <laughs> as to why that I, I did inquire as to why they why they hadn't booked me again and I was told um, that they thought I'd died <laughs> so I, I thought you know on that on that fair, fair comment. on that note I thought you know that that will drive me forward even more thanks very much guys. <laughs> inspiration well, to just sit and listen yeah uh, I'll, I'll say about inspiration you know you, you talk about Birmingham being at the heart of you wanting to emulate that further up the M6 uh fantastic uh <laughs> I'm really lost for words. I really am. I, I don't know what to say. Well, I could well, sit the, the, and listen the, the, to this history record, forever. I mean, you, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, Anthony Coelho, who, who, who works tremendously hard nowadays, you know, trying to represent uh, Birmingham and, and represent, you know, some of the history that happened. But, I mean, he, he, he was involved in Summit Records. I never I never shot much at Summit Records. I was always looked after so well by other people, uh, you know, particularly spinning records. Um, I've been very lucky with... with you're making connections with music. I suppose uh, in some cases dealers would come to me because they know the record would get played and talked about and if they got a hundred copies tucked away, they're going to sell them. But um, yeah, I, it, 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 for me, the, the way that club culture has evolved and, and obviously I had that period of illness in, in the late eighties uh, before I got back on the ride again properly. But um, you know, even, even coming back now, even coming back sort of, 15 years ago and refocusing and, and being able to play new music and, and, and put on events again, you know, like Vibe, which I do once a year, and Freestyling, which we had 10 years in Manchester, bringing that jazzy soul mixture back and just fantastic people, fantastic opportunities. And I, I feel, you know, we've had, I'm not saying the pandemic's over, it, it's not going to be over for a long time, but I'm, I'm 
reinvigorated by the the show on Worldwide FM to 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 even at sixty eight to go back and start something else, start mm-hmm. something else that is going to be magical. Well, before we talk about the the continuation and and this journey, let us take let us take a trip back to Neil to those glory days when he uh, stumbled upon the gold mine, so to speak. Um, you said you, you you felt quite fortunate, quite lucky. You had to have been in the right place and and been aware for the opportunity that presented itself to be able to push it forward now, right? Yeah, I, I think you have to, to be in the right place at the right time. You, you have to have done all the work, don't you? You know yeah. I mean? I had, um, I got the ears and I'd learned from the Infernal label how to run a record label. I just said about royalties and everything. And... Um, you know, I say I just heard the Detroit records. I was probably being a bit slicker than that. I was aware that the Chicago records weren't available and these other things came through. So I didn't just ring Derek up and say, hello, mate, what, what do you think? I mean, the thing was, can we do something together? And when he came over, yeah, it was right place, right time. But I think I was really good for that because uh, I'd, I'd pack my job up. I'd had to convince my then wife, Jane, that I wouldn't, you know, end up on the street. So I had to make it work and... Um, with Derek, I mean, records like The Dance, Rhythm is Rhythm, and Springs of Life, obviously, Nude Photo, they were so good. I mean, I just thought, well, not so much I've done one on a gold mine. I, I want to be able to deliver with these guys' music and, and, and get it over, you know? And um, I'll tell you a funny story about the, the, the sort of London Midlands thing, London's North thing. I, um, I took Derek down to uh, Fall from Broadway. And we went to Chrysalis Music. There was someone there who, who was quite sus for the time. But I went to Fourth Broadway and basically said, look, Island Records, Fourth Broadway, Derek May, this is the perfect marriage. And the a and guy there, who's, who's quite a highly rated a and guy, basically said to me, oh, I don't get it. I went, hang on, hang on. It's like probably the best dance records in Sex Machine. Derek's a complete star. You're Fourth from Broadway. It's perfect. And didn't get it. And uh, I went round to the pub with Derek and said, listen, we'll do it another way. We're not going to try and tell people like this that they should sign the records. We'll, in effect, release the records ourselves. So, as I say, then I mentioned before, a couple of weeks later, Derek had done the remix to Tika and a fast track. So I saw Mick Clark. And Mick Clark was a southerner, but a very open-minded southerner, a great jazz funk fan. And um, he basically sort of said, yeah, what do you want to do? And a guy called David Betty, who's one of the early days, early guys from Ireland Records and Sue Records, who had some kind of consultancy. And I think he, um, he empathised with what I was trying to say because he knew all about independent labels. And they went, for, they went for it. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely worked. I mean, I worked really hard, you know. I think, actually, Colin came round to my house when I came up with the tape, didn't, didn't you, Colin? Yeah, well, I did, yeah. Big fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and um, he was just, a, you know, he was just great. But... Even then, we were releasing the records and um, things like Our Time, Our Theme. We licensed that to Chrysalis and then Danny D wanted to remix it, which we didn't want to do, so we got the record back, put that out, and um, things like people Jive Records wanted to take it all over, that had ruined the whole thing. Um, it, was, it wasn't that easy. It wasn't that everyone understood it. But uh, to be fair at the time, I, I think no one really knew what was going on with, with house music. I mean, when Big Fun was about to chart, John Moss and myself were in Pete Tong's office at FFRR, and Pete said, oh, I think you're going to have the first Deep House hit. It wasn't Deep House record, but at the time, no slur on Pete. I mean, there was no one really knew what, the, you know, what, what to do, or what to call stuff. But then I think we were good because we, we realised that you could break this music via the UK. And a group like Ten City at Atlantic, they didn't have anyone like us to do that. So they had, they had that, was a, that was an American group signed to an American label. So it was a UK label responding to what was going on in America where... We basically broke it via the UK club culture thing. And, um, I mean, ironically, we, we never got a success in the States because they, they didn't like the fact that in the city were broken from, 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 from the UK. But, uh, yeah, I mean, um, it certainly wasn't me being, you know, finding a gold mine and being lucky. I, I, did, I did work my arse up on it. But it was a privilege to do it because, I, I mean, I was just, I was in awe of the guys, the records I made. I was, I mean, I, I sort of going on a few years. I was in the studio in Detroit when Kevin recorded Inner City Pennies from Heaven, and there was members of the house doing backing vocals, Rachel Cap, uh, lead vocals, I think. Um, oh, someone else, I'm trying to think. Um, anyway, complete, uh, um, 
complete all star cast. And to me, that's just like one of the greatest records ever. And to be to be there, to be instrumental in it, well, not instrumental, but to be part of it, you know, it was just amazing. It was just a complete trip and a privilege. Just sitting here in, in awe myself, listening to those times, because that will then also be in um, a transitional period where the house then started to move into the fields and, and into the, the larger raves and the sound of network itself would actually change and you would find younger stars and nurture those as well right now? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the first records by the Detroit guys came out on Cool Cat, which is our label. And the the original artwork for Cool Cat was horrible, but if you look if you look at the it was like the handwriting, was, wasn't it? Wasn't it a handwritten drawing? Well, sort of. But if if you look at some of the things like art, where, where, art where, like where that, did you get where did you get the name Cool Cat from? Tell him. <laughs> uh, there was one of my favourite records is by Joe Matthews, "Ain't Nothing Joe You Can <laughs> Do," and the label's Cool Cat. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we also we also we, when we had our split with Pinnacle, we had to sort of a new label, and um, I started six six six. Which was basically S I X six, which means six by six Earl Van Dyke. So there was there was another <laughs> sort of, and then the other one I did, Colin. You'll love this one. When I did the Techno album, uh, because of Detroit, and it, there was a thing uh, when we were getting into this, and uh, there was a, a, a numbering system Z T S C. A lot of the records were mastered at, at places called Z T S C. Yes, no one yes. really knew how it worked. So if you look at the Inner City, if sorry, if you look at the Techno album, it says a Z T S E production. That was my in joke, you know. So. <laughs> but, but, yeah, which, which, which would take me back to, of all places, Landudno in Wales, which is the first time I ever saw a ZTSC collection, and that, that was Bob Foster, where he had this this complete rack of records, about five or six shelves, and, and his pride was that they were all ZTSC records. He you know, pulled them out randomly and just keep showing me this, this in did, the groove. I, I tell you what, ZTSC. looking back to how much we didn't know, did he actually know what ZTS meant? Because it, it was basically, it's an index from Ashwin, isn't it? It's, 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 yes, 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 yes. So there must have been lots of pop stuff that was ZTSC, mustn't there? And oh, yes, yes. And, I, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was lots of pop stuff. I mean, I mean I, I'm not saying Bob had lots of pop stuff. Bob Bob was just sifting what it, what, what, what he wanted, but it, it was it was very much part of the way he collected, you know, yeah, that, that, that yeah, sort of logo. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. a, again, you're talking about the connections that you and I both have with with the, with these cities in America, particularly Chicago, and the music. It, if you, you know, when it, even when you look back at Vega and people like that, you you know, they were relating to the people who they loved. I mean, we'd already done the Roy Ayers thing ourselves. You, you know, Roy Ayers at Blackpool. We had Roy Ayers at uh, Birmingham Locarno. Uh, Roy Ayers, you know, pretty much since then everywhere. I mean, you know, one of the most prolific <laughs> jazz folk artists. Um, but you know, when 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 I first played uh, Running Away at at, uh, at Blackpool Mecca, I mean, it, it it took on a life of its own. Everybody wanted to own it, and and it almost single handedly changed the way people viewed jazz funk, uh, because the record I played at Blackpool before that was Hey, uh, what you say? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> but what Running Away really really sealed the deal, and and and. You know, Manchester Ritz was a good example, and, and also the Lacano, you know, where you where you drop a record like that and it still stands up to this day. Right. But yeah, there, there, there was there was that 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 period, that great period for me, um, and and then to come out the other side of it at the end of the eighties when Alex started the weekend as as say in nineteen eighty eight, um, and, and you know the rest of that is history, of course, and uh, yeah, you know, I came came back on board quite a few times over the years, but I mean, this time will be nice again. I mean, the last time I played down there for him, Gregory Porter was there and um, I spoke to Gregory before he went on to play and uh, and I said, uh, you're going to be a superstar. I said, I've been pasting your record. The Apollo remix of your record, I've been absolutely pasting it. And, and he stopped me and he said, what does pasting mean? <laughs> uh, I said, well, it's nothing to do with decorating. It's it's, it's to do with you know, re getting an unbelievable reaction to the record. I said, but eighty percent of the people, ninety percent of the people in this room, you're going to go in. I have no clue who you are or what you do. And he went in there, and the band he played with that day for for Alex at the Southport weekend, uh, which was ironically in uh, where was it Maidenhead or Maidstone, <laughs> but but he went on. Minehead. He Minehead, yeah. He ripped the place apart. He, he totally ripped the place apart. 
a few questions as to why he was wearing a hat, but not many because it, it just absolutely devastated the place. And to see him move to where he's gone today is is absolute for me absolutely magical. I've still got the picture I took with him that day. I had a picture with him, and later the same day with Josh Milan, mm. and you know that that was just another magical moment where the British the British scene. Coupled, of course, with the uh, the the, the, the uh, talent, the talent of Mr. Opalopo, Peter himself, uh, hmm. you know, just the combination of that. Because I mean, I was playing tracks on the radio from uh, Gregory's album Water, but you know, when I heard that remix, I thought, this is it. This is gonna, this is gonna change it for the scene. Little did I know how much it was gonna change it for, you know, because that brought him to so many people's attention. Did you know he was Strictly Come Dancing last week? They're trying to they're trying to turn him into a, a BMW driver's uh, CD artist nowadays. But um, did you see him on the TV last week, Colin? I, well, I don't think so. No, he was on Stri- he was on Strictly Come Dancing. He performed on Strictly wow. Come Dancing last week. Wow. Uh, but, well, it won't come as a big surprise to many people that I don't watch Strictly Come Down. <laughs> you do, come <laughs> on. Now. The only dancing I do, Andy, is in my head. <laughs> I haven't danced since Please Operator by Tony and Tyrone, a Northern Soul classic. Wow. <laughs> back in the 70s. No, I don't dance. I, You're I, going I, back. So I, Neil, I, Neil's just disappeared. I, I, I know what... Um, I think part of the skill of DJing is know, knowing how to make people dance, yeah. Right. Okay. I do but, that. I do that with programming. <laughs> not, indeed. Not with well, that's a whole different conversation, right there. The 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 power of pr- programming over technicality. Uh, that's a, a great conversation. Another, also another great conversation is the advancement of technology and the fact that music is so readily available to so many people now. Uh, so that does people can kind of. Back in the day, you had to physically yeah. own the piece of vinyl to get your to, to earn your stripes. Now you, anyone yeah, can get you, hold of it. Go, if you go if you go back to you know the the the, the burgeoning soul scene in in, in the late sixties, um, then yes, uh, uh, most of the soul records that were played were on British labels, but they were they were actually licensed from American labels. You know, the first generation of people, Roger Eagle, who came over from Liverpool to Manchester and started the Twisted Wheel. Uh, it really, with 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 R and B, with blues, um, you know, Sonny Boy Williamson, Muddy Waters, those kind of records. Uh, but then that developed into you know British soul being played. Uh, you know, le- British labels like Stateside, HMV. You know, lots of uh, excellent British labels, and 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 eventually you know Stu Records and people like that were licensing American records. But then during the early seventies, uh, the records import records became a known phenomena in this country and more and more people started collecting that. So it just opened up, you know, a whole new raft of things, but this was all about the only way you could own records was on vinyl. Mm -hmm. So it would be the minority of people who who would own these kind of underground records. And that was how they got their notoriety. Yes. People would, people would travel to, to, to listen to people who were playing these records. And then later, of course, we went into the 70s and then the 12-inch disc became available and things became more commercial. Albums became uh, more prolific sales. And still probably the biggest soul album seller in this country is probably Robbie Vincent because he had the only, you know, crazily, he still has, has had the only national soul show in the UK. All these years later, we've got thousands of internet shows, but there's only ever been one national soul show in the UK. And that was Robbie Vincent eventually taken over by Jeff Young, but not, not given the same sort of, um, look. Um, then we moved to 12s and then we moved to CDs and then we now move to sticks. <laughs> Some people haven't taken that ride. So Neil, that journey, you, you went along that journey. Did you, uh, I was thinking then when we were talking about uh, earning the notoriety of, of having to have the vinyl. Did you ever, uh, and then the whole bootleg scenario on the Northern soul scene and whatever, did you ever get struck with that curse? Was that uh, something that you had to deal with down the years, bootlegs and the likes? Well, what we did, we, um, we, we, uh, we, we, I started with Ian Dewis, that we were importing records from the States and um, a company called Selected is gone. Well, they were the day with the market leaders from Nottingham. They went bust. And the infamous Simon Suzanne, Simone Suzanne, he, he basically was still supplying stuff. Ian went over there. We were buying records from um, from Simon. 
and he was claiming stuff was legit and some of it wasn't. And what we, we, we didn't really like that. So what I started doing before I started the Inferno label was um, go to the British record labels like Mercury. I'd get 5,000 copies of Moody Woman, Jerry Butler, by, uh, Polydor, 5,000 copies of Millie Jackson, uh, Doris Child, who anything actually rang up uh, Maurice Levy, the, the, the mafia boss, to, to, to uh, I asked him to order pie to press him up for me. And from that, um, we uh, there was an incredible trip to, to um, New York. The night I'll tell you about the night, I just regret the night before myself and Lesbian Kutcher went to a new music disco seminar. And uh, remember Jane Brinton, Colin from Manchester at the Ritz, yes, the yes. house old lady. So she, she we, we tried to blag her in, and she they said, You got we no still got chance. some pictures, yeah. And Jane sort of said, Oh, I know you guys are coming, and she said, Oh. Tonight, you've got to go and see this DJ called Bert the Flirt. This is the height of the disco explosion. Um, well, I call it disco. I'm just great music. And they're going to play three three records that will blow your mind. And uh, in an hour, we had the world exclusive plays of Dance, 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 She, I Feel Love, Donna Summer, and Best of a Lot, Best of the Lot, Barry White, Ecstasy, when you lay down next to me. Anyway, that was on the night. That blew our minds. The next day, talking about records and, and sales and so on, uh, against the bootleg thing, we saw a guy like an Al Shulman at uh, CBS. And we actually ordered. He didn't believe we, we could. We, we, he didn't believe us. We were really scruffy and thin at the time, and whatever. Probably thought we were going to afford to buy a coffee. We did an initial order of fifty-two thousand records, and uh, I built up this distribution network, which was quite useful for selling tickets, and things like Platform Echo, shops all over the Midlands and Northwest, and some in the South. And from that, I started my own label. So um, you know, and then as far as me on the rarity thing, yeah, I, I got struck. I got struck by the thing. I was. I like travel three hundred miles to buy a record and go to America to look search for records. Yeah, I, was, I, I mean that disease definitely still with me, you know. <laughs> well, the, the, I'm, the, I'm glad the, I never got the, inflicted with that myself. No, oh, no, yeah. the, the original, you know, some of the original bootleggers though. I mean, Soul Sounds was was an original bootlegger, a guy called Jeff King from Leicester, uh, with his uh, trusty sidekick Batman. I mean, I was in. Uh, no, one of the Northern Soul Legends house and, and a long-time friend of mine who passed away recently, Keith Minshall, and he was waiting for the first delivery of Soul Sounds. And these, you know, the first one was maybe reconsidered by Leon Hayward, which was a rare record on Flatfish Records, which um, was impossible to find in those days. Um, there was no internet. There was no way you could go and, and, and find records like that. Um, but, what, but what bootlegs actually did was enabled people who came along to the gigs to buy the records for a pound or 85 pence or whatever it was. And it actually helped spread the word you know, because, because people who got involved in the soul scene and people who get involved in any scene, they want to belong to something. And when they find something that they can connect with the, the, the way of growing it at that time, I'm not, I'm not endorsing that the, the bootlegging is okay. It isn't okay, but it certainly helped expand the scene because it allowed record shops to stock these things, select a disc being one of them um, that Neil's mentioned. Uh, but then you've got people like Neil who, who, who were coming up and, and picking up, doing it the right way, going through the record companies. And, and a lot of records got released that way as well. But I think bootlegs have played a part in every type of music um, and, and still do today. Um, you know, every kind of black music, unfortunately, and, and you know, it's still happening. People still doing it, not admitting it. But I mean, one of the easiest scenes to exploit is the northern soul scene. Yeah. Um, very difficult because so many of the artists now are not alive anymore. Um, you know, you're finding people who would would even know it's going on to fight the cause. It, it's it's just impossible. Extremely difficult. Well, let me uh, I'll, I'll I'll let me interject. I'll come to you one second, Neil. Well, Sorry, Neil, let me come to you in one second. Uh, we got plenty of time, plenty of time. We're getting a hell of a lot of people that are passing through and commenting. So I'm going to say again, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for your eyes and your ears. Deep in conversation with these legends. So I'm just sitting here listening to them. Um, we will come and, and mention you guys a little later on. Uh, sorry, Neil, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to sorry. let people know that I am reading all of their comments. Do continue. Yeah, just on the side about the bootleg, and often boot, records were bootlegged. They, they, they didn't need to be bootlegged. I mean, one of the real early Northern Soul classics was by Frank Beverly and the Butlers, who went on to form Maze. Well, if that's what you wanted, that was bootlegged by Simon Suzanne. And the very same trip that I mentioned in New York with the Sony thing and the I Feel Love, whatever, I went to see the, I was about to form Inferno. I didn't quite know what, how I did the contracts. And I'd 
contacted a guy from the billboard. Uh, there's a billboard annual, I don't know, Bible you'd ring off, a trade guide, a guy called Billy Jackson. It was, he, he produced this record. And there was, they came out on Kenny Gamble and Lee Enough's label, Gamble. Before that, he'd released on his own label, Sassy. And it was like, it was a real absolute Northern Soul classic. I think there was like 20 copies in the UK. And I went to his apartment and I found 850. Crazy. <laughs> and, and I, but check this out. I got them for a dollar each. I sold most of them for three pound each wholesale. Sold a few for 15 retail. They're now 400, 500 pounds each. So if I'd have kept them, which would have been stupid, that would have been what four hundred grand. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it, and Detroit, you know, there was there's, um, there's so many of the uh, records like Rictic, which was a, a classic label. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of them. I, I, um, I, I, it's a bit bizarre, but like Colin said, I think the bootleg it popularised it. It made people be able to. to I mean, if you'd just been ten DJs or twenty DJs with with, with a rare record each, there would, no one's had the chance to buy the records. It wouldn't have spread it. It would have, it would it would have petered out. Okay, so I'm going to bring this conversation back onto topic with regards to Birmingham. Uh, mm. Talking about records, um, let's continue with the history of releases that you were responsible for because amongst um, the entire house music fraternity, everybody is more than aware of what you've done and what you were responsible for. And yet there will still be some people who may not necessarily be aware of your involvement and, and which is what I wanted this conversation to be about just how influential Birmingham was uh, in the, for the development of the Northern soul scene, the funk, the, the, the soul scene of the old days, and then the early house sound, the Detroit sound. And then that would have progressed to the turn of the nineties um, into the, the white, the white gloves and the glow sticks you were you were there yeah. at the beginning of all that as well right yeah i mean um i'm trying to I'm trying to get my ears right so 87 was when strings of life was first popular in the uk oh, that, that and, rings a bell that, yeah <laughs> uh, yeah i know yeah and um 88 it, it wasn't until the 88 till the rave took off that record really got popular mm -hmm. i mean it was it was a big record but it wasn't like the anthem of anthems um so yeah, we, we we as a house label, we we were releasing things like a lot of UK stuff, you know, with Matic Take Me Back, which I thought was just you know genius, amazing record. I mean, that one was like Mark Gamble from Nottingham. We made it in his bedroom, and Mark coming back, come back to our office in Stratford Place twice, and I was with Neil Macy, and it was just like, I mean, our idea of A and R was to say it's brilliant, carry on, you know, we weren't we were trying to be Jerry Wexler. <laughs> So you mentioned Neil Macy there, another legend. Uh, yeah. how, how does that connection come about? Um, okay. Um, Pat Ward, um, my friend, was uh, from the Northern Soul scene. He's now runs KRD Distribution with the Bud Board. Mm -hmm. uh, he was DJing at Number Seven's Wine Bar. I was just, when you mentioned Burntwood earlier, living in Burntwood, I was going to say, so did you have any involvement in Number 7s? Because yeah, well, when I just passed my driving test, we always used to go down the country lanes to get right, to there yeah. on the pool. I, Loved Number 7s. Yeah, um, Thursday nights was when Pat, I think Macy was DJing, wasn't he? Oh, uh, I wouldn't uh, know. What, I was 16, yeah, 17 at the time. What I, what I, I used to get the acetates from Detroit. I used to get, you know, text of vanilla to play first. And that's where I met Neil, but just as importantly, that's where I met Mark Archer. Right. So Mark was there, and uh, he was he, they'd done the first Next to Twenty One records for the Stafford label, um, Blue Chip, and uh, Blue Chip I think have gone out of business. And I got talking to Mark, and he was like, "You you you manage Derek May?" I said, "Yeah yeah yeah." And he slept on that's called slept on the floor, not too far away my head. You know, I, I was I was I was I was I was in the studio with Mark at at, at, at Jail Muse. Yeah, and and they, they they were taking the session after, but I stayed behind a couple of times. I was trying to make a record at that time. It's not difficult to make a record when you don't have any talent. <laughs> I don't know about that. And many many people have managed down the years. <laughs> I don't know about that. Mate. Get a good engineer, you'll be all right. Um, so I, I met Mark there, and um, that, that was that was great for us because next to twenty one. Well, like, you know, forget the rave thing. They were leading techno guys, weren't they? You know, they, 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 they I mean, some of the stuff, some of the stuff they were sampling, like they, they sampled Derek's The Dance outrageously, you know. But um, anyway, so yeah, to, to answer your question, so we were signing groups like Rhythmatic, um, Nexus 21, and we became part of that whole rave movement, you know. I mean, 
uh, and then it exploded, didn't it? I mean, talking about 89 and then 1991. I mean, when, when we had the hits with Alternate, it was just crazy for us, you know? Do you take uh, much responsibility? Do you claim the word I'm looking for? Do you claim much responsibility with your A&R skills and your vision? Did you have much direction there? What, for the rave scene? With the music, with the artists, the, the avenues they were Not taking, really. helping I mean, to push them. My, 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 you took someone like Lee Fisher. How can you tell Lee Fisher how to make a record? But my, my whole thing was, if I didn't like something, I'd tell people. But, I mean, we, we didn't sign people who I didn't like the stuff. And just encourage people and maybe suggest collaborations. Um, I mean, there's a thing, I think, oh, my goodness. Uh, there's, there's, there's one alternate record where Latrice, who married Mark Kinchin, very soulfully sings release the pressure that was that, that was recording stuff that was me that was my claim to there any bit of soul to the road thing um but no not really i mean um we, the, the, there's a lot of records that we were offered we didn't release i mean we, we didn't just sign anything that moved and but i really believed in the people you know i believed in mark gamble then size store um who came over and did stuff for us and um, and then we, we had the involvement in New York with Andrew Comis, which was the, the garage thing. So, I mean, I love that, you know, the, the First Choice label, which is based on the Salsa Group, First Choice. Um, but I was never a producer, you know, but I was, I was I, I, but if, if, I, if I thought something wouldn't work, I mean, with Alternate, it was in, it, the Nexus 21 is interesting because we, we were involved in what happened there. Nexus 21 were like the ultimate pure techno group. I mean, now Mark and Chris, that, that that history gets forgotten. People talk about them being like alternate mint rave cartoon group, but then the next to twenty one stuff really stands the you know the test of time. We've I've released a few of the some extra one things lately, and they, there's some really really classic all time stuff. But what happened with that was with with, with with the rave thing and Mark and Chris, they came in one day to the office and said, "We've done eight tracks, and we don't know what to do with it, and if we can't do it as next to twenty one." We all said that. And uh, my contribution was they said it's going to be the alternate A L T E R N A T E P. And I said, no, just do alternate. Nice. Um, nice. So. Uh, had they actually, had they actually uh, parted ways at that point or was that to come? No, 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 no. They had loads of success up till not. Uh, obviously, this is before we had any, any hits. So I know we had, we had two, two or three, two years or three years and then. They fell out really badly, didn't they? You know. Right. Okay. Because I say on many occasions the the history in my mind gets jumbled up. But listening yeah, to it now, yeah, that's obvious. Yeah. They hadn't had their their uh, strike at fame yet, so they couldn't have split no. up. No, uh, so no. yeah, the label Neil obviously responsible for the, for the label behind Alternate, amongst many other things. Uh, running I mean, side we, by side, what else was going on at the same time? Um. Well, musically, I mean, we did the biorhythm albums in 1990, which were like pure electronica, you know, I mean, gorgeous. And that, I'm really, really doing a bi did biorhythm one and two, both in 1990. And I'm doing volume three, 31 years later, that's released a week on Monday. But um, so we got into this whole thing about compilation and understanding stuff. And at that time, I actually proposed to someone, it wasn't Telstar, we, we were licensing lots of stuff to compilation. Companies. That's what kept the business going, really. I actually said to him, TV campaign, Carl Cox, Kid in a Bedroom, mix albums, nah, didn't, didn't, they couldn't see it. But we went from, from Biorhythms, we went to do the New Groove albums. I love the New Groove label. I know Colin's a fan. And I got on really well with Frank Mendez, who owned it. And Frank was, you know, it could be a bit difficult, but he, he loved us. I think he, I think he realised we were kind of spirits. We were both insane, you know, and very anti-major record labels. We did that. And then... As the whole thing evolved with the compilations, um, with, with the scene and everything, we did the Renaissance albums. Okay. And Renaissance, yeah, it was a complete game changer because up till then, the biggest selling mix album was Tony Humphreys on Ministry of Sound, and that sold maybe 25, 28,000. Was that the sessions? And had, and yeah, one of them, yeah. And, and uh, I'd had this idea of, of, the, of uh, doing the mix album thing properly, and we did the thing with Jeff Oak, so we did the Sasha Digweed album. And that sold 118,000, which was like mind blowing. So we turned over about, I mean, for, for discounts, I mean, it, we turned over like 1.2 million pounds on that and then did the same on volume two. So, you know, this thing had been a label who we just, we, did, we had success with this and that. I mean, the, the fact we did that, I thought was incredible, really. We were, I mean, later on, Cream, 
sold more albums than us, Ministry of Sound on those. And like, that would have been the we, precursor to the likes of Journey by DJs and things like that. Actually, it was maybe around the same time because one of the things that we did in Birmingham in the Custer Factory, we, we distributed all the labels mm-hmm. and we distributed Journey by DJs. So did I the No, I, don't, I, I think them, I think maybe that they're the Colcom. I think that might have been just after we did Renaissance. I'm not because because we we were distributing that. And the other thing about Birmingham, you know, with network at the Custer Factory, we were distributing 35 labels. So we were quite sort of centered of the industry. And proof that it worked was that when when Lee Fisher and uh, Jules came up with All Fun Top Mother, which I loved, and I was so envious he wasn't he couldn't get it for network. I mean, we did eventually later. But we, we, because we got our, our stuff together so well, I mean, this is a good thing for Birmingham. I said, well, look, you, you don't, you can go through us, and we can, we can shove it through Sony, but do it all via Birmingham. And and they did. They had a chart record. They got paid, you know, got paid every month. We we had the setup to do that. Unfortunately, I think my focus, I, we were doing too much. We got too close to the sun, and I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't really be distributing thirty five other labels. It's hard enough to run your own label. I remember like one, one well known label. I, mean, I think I gave him £40,000 advance. It was just crazy. I mean, we, we shouldn't have been doing anything like that. You know, if you're going to do something, just concentrate on your own stuff. And I wish, looking back, I wish I'd have sold off the distribution company and um, and whatever. But, yeah, we, we were, we, I mean, we had the Detroit stuff. We had the New York stuff, Andrew Comis. We had lots of UK recordings. Um, it, was, it was just an amazing time, you know, and we were very, very pro-Birmingham. I mean... The KMS label we did with Kevin, we and his own imprint. If you look at it, it's got three Berlin, then what Berlin, Birmingham, Detroit, Berlin, <laughs> 0121313. So we, we we flew the flag, you know what I mean? We were really passionate about it. I think partly because it was a good thing to have a stance against the major record labels, because why would you want to be part of that? But also genuinely we were, you know, we were very independent, very fierce about it, and really liked doing it from Birmingham. I mean, until we got involved with Sony, it was all our money. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we started off with a six grand bank overdraft, and after that, we had to make the money from advances, from compilation companies, or whatever. You know, we had to be really ingenious. It wasn't like there was anyone behind us funding us. Um, so, you know, it, it was it was a trip. You know, and uh, later on, we I worked with Birmingham Connection. We worked with the Groove Corporation. Is that Danny? You know, no, that's uh, Brian Dordoff. Right. And you probably know but, but, but you write you write about, about new groove records. Yeah, I, I collected every single record on new groove. I collected every single record on strictly rhythm, and every single record on bottom line records. I mean, those labels for me were just changing the world. And and uh, you know, Neil, Neil again. I mean, he doesn't give himself enough credit sometimes. So it, you know, he may not. It may not feel like a vision. The same way that. You know, I'd look back on, on my career in the UK and, and, and people say, how did you think of that? You didn't. We, we just we, we just progressed sort of organically because of the way our minds work and, the, and the, the way we do the job. We also know what level things have to be at. And, 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 and that allows you to make decisions not just about records, but also about people, about events, you know, what may or may not work. You felt a responsibility. Also, 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 Neil has, you know, Again, the the inner passion, and and I'm very similar to Neil. I'm I'm, I'm very Midlands and Northwest centric. <laughs> Did you feel a responsibility, Colin, to to fly the flag and represent the sand, represent your heritage, and to and to continue to push that to continue to push that forward? I think I think I think I, th- I think I wouldn't be here unless I was doing that. You know, I, 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 yeah. I mean, obviously, as as time's gone on, and and, and you know, because I've I've had an interest in so many different scenes. Uh, whether it's Northern Soul, whether it's 70s Soul. I, I, I champion 70s Soul like nobody else. Nobody else was buying the records I was buying. Nobody else, most other people weren't playing them either. And it's taken some people 30 years to you know, to get to that point with that. Um, the jazz funk thing, everybody said I was a fool to leave Blackpool Mecca and go to Manchester. Um, the house thing again, you know, why are you playing this music? It's not music. It, yes, it is music. Um, you know, and, and so... Once, once, once you've achieved something at a certain level, then you know yourself. You've got to maintain that level, no matter which direction you go in. So, if it's jazz, I I know the level. If it's house, I know where I've got to be. And 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 with soul, the same. Whether it's seventies, whether it's northern. And I haven't been able to to keep the respect that I, I get from people by by not 
flying the flag because I've got to. And, and, and each of my shows that goes out on Colin Curtis Podomatic every week, whether it's the Worldwide FM show, whether it's a House of Soul show, um, or whether it's a soul show, it, it, it's all about new music. Because unless people push new music, there won't be any old music, you know, because people won't know it. It's difficult enough in, in today's environment with so much music, and you, you've intimated to that early on how difficult it is to stay on top. So at 68 years old, I'm trying to stay on top by using a computer to hold it together and, and, and listen to as much stuff as possible. But still the most exciting thing for me is the next exciting thing I hear, <laughs> which could be tomorrow, it could be the day after. I mean, we've touched on a couple Neil's mentioned as well, because he released important records, life-changing records like Gil Scott Heron. You know, the fact that the bottle... The record itself is immense. Introduced people to the culture of Gil Scott Heron. Introduced people to bands like The Last Poets. Introduced hip hop people further down the line to that. They, they were already doing hip hop. They were already doing rap. Mm -hmm. You know, Douglas Records in the States. That you know, it was all part of that evolution. So for me, when something comes along like electro comes along, and all the soul boys run away, they say, "Oh, this isn't soul music." Yes, it is. It's music that moves it your soul and it's moving people's soul. And and at Rock City, the all day lineups, for instance, went from you know, the same way Blackpool Mecca went from Junior Walker, um, to, to to what you know, Edwin Starr, uh, JJ Barnes. It, it moved on. Neil was promoting the Players Association, he was promoting brass construction at the height of their career at the height of Brass Construction's career. The biggest funk band in the world were at Blackpool Mecca. Roy Ayers was at Blackpool Mecca. Players Association at Blackpool Mecca. Sylvester, who changed the whole disco thing in New York, was at Blackpool Mecca, backed by two tons of fun. And I had a great moment with them backstage where these two ladies you know, were, were <laughs> of, of the larger denomination. And they, I asked them if they wanted to, a chair to sit on. <laughs> and uh, I fetched three chairs, and they sat on three chairs, the two of them. Between the two of them. To, to the point we cried. But fantastic moments like that, where, where, where you know, something's been opened, something sparks. Do you it, feel you know, an me, affinity now, Colin, uh, if I may ask? Do you feel an affinity now with the younger crowd uh, when you go out and about? Do you feel that there is that connection? Do you feel that there is the desire for people to go back and discover well, the old I've, music. I've, I've always avoided uh, festivals. Uh, uh, you know, uh, mud, rain, wind, <laughs> cold, tents. That's not something that I really do anymore. And um, I, I, I don't think I ever did it. Um, so Giles has got me back involved with the We Out Here Festival. And so going into that, and I'm going in DJing, I'm 68 years old, DJing to kids in front of me who are 16, 17, 18. So, yeah, you, you, you've got to bring in all your tools. You've got to bring in you, you, the new music element. You, you've got to bring in the historic element. I, I've done two sets now with Mr. Scruff. Um, we had a phenomenal response, all age groups, kids and whatever. So given the opportunity, yes, I, I'm, I'm able to connect. And I think through the through the jazz show as well, I've been able to connect with, with younger people. And um, I'm down in Spiritland in London a week on Friday and, I'd, I've done it twice before. The first time it was more of an older crowd. The second time, because it was the beginning of the pandemic, although we didn't know what was coming, uh, a lot of the older people stayed away and a lot of younger people came down there. And the amount of interest in the music I was playing was phenomenal. And that's what drives you on. That's what makes you think, you know, there's, there's still more to go here, you know. So at some mm -hmm. point I'll run out of breath, but at the moment, <laughs> no, uh, no, 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 never. You well, just, your your legacy, no, your legacy keep, will keep live doing on, it and, and and keep doing it. And and because I know the level it's at, I don't have the reputation of some of the world's house DJs. No, and I don't want that. I, 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 this isn't why I do it. I, I, I do it because, you know, when I used to sit in my bedroom collecting records myself and playing at the local youth club on one deck, um. It was because I wanted to share what was happening to me, the excitement of those records. And so these changes, the magical moment in Birmingham at Chaplin's, and, and one, of, one of the greatest jazz funk clubs at the time, the Rum Runner, with Sean Williams, Dave Till, uh, you know, the crowd, you know, the individual dance experience of that, the fashion that was involved in that, because upstairs on, on, on a Monday night at the Soul Night, upstairs rehearsing, and I lent, the bass player, a couple of uh, inner city jazz albums 
he wanted to listen to. I never got them back, by the way. But the band upstairs was Duran Duran, playing upstairs in the room and they're practicing. And I was given uh, uh, an acetate of uh, a single called Planet Earth. Mm, heard of that. What was that all about? What, what was that all about? I've still got it somewhere, but you know, I didn't want it. You know, I mean, I mean and, they, and they became absolutely bloody huge. But again, out of, out of Birmingham, but born amazing. Out of Birmingham. So Neil, let, let let me ask you then about you've got projects coming out now, thirty one years later from the original concept. Yeah. Do you feel a lot of pressure? to um conform to find the the path to connect with the the younger crowd or are you is it like now nah, forget them this is you know the, the, um whoever this is meant to reach well, it will reach um i've been releasing re-releasing um and kind of reimagining some of the network releases uh say reimagine because the buyer rhythm it's got it's got stuff it's got new stuff from 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 new artists but the bit that's been really, really amazing for me, I, I did a, I did a talk, a presentation um, at um, oh, what, what was, was it? The... Cafe Artem. Yeah, the original Cafe Artem, not the one in Hockey Social. Yeah, opposite, yeah. opposite the uh, Q opposite, Club. Opposite. Yeah, yeah, and it was astonishing. Um, well, what happened? I'd been there a few months, a few weeks before, a few, and because um, I knew Chrissy from there, and um, I got to know him rather. And they were doing a, this amazingly weird lecture uh, at Timothy University about the Berlin, Birmingham techno connection. I thought it was absurd, you know. And um, there was this guy who was, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not slagging him off the sake of it, but he was a nice enough guy, but he was all over the shop. He was basically talking about how my banks was impossible to speak to and all this stuff. And it was, it was crap. And one of the guys, is it Joe Collins, one of the guys who does the ar the archive stuff? I said, well, Neil's it. And I basically said, look, if you want to speak to Mike Banks, this is his number. I can ring him now. And from that, they said, we you do this network thing? And because Mike Banks is, he, I mean, to me, he was one of the nicest men in the world. You know, I mean, not. He, he used to be a, a bailiff in East Detroit, so obviously and he's got a reputation. But I've, I've just found him a darling. You know. Anyway, so I ended up doing this lecture thing with John Mostyn, and from that. We're always releasing the stuff, but I, I didn't realise just how, um, and it's really nice. And I'm, I, I was, I am, I am surprised with just how, um, how revered, if that's the right word, or I love the network stuff is. You know what I mean? Well, why? Do it, why would that surprise you, man? Well, I think it's it's a bit like what Colin just said. You, at the time when you do something, you're in the middle of a storm, aren't you? You know what I mean? And you're just like, you got to, how can I pay the bills? I've got to. I, I, at the time, I was working in the office in Camp Hill. And I'd come home and I'd take calls from America there five hours behind. So I worked really hard. And, you know, can I get the rights to work at Tabon and Lennar? Um, um, ZTT want to do this super group with Derek Watt and Kevin, which is absurd. They want to be like a black pet shop boys. There's, a, there's so much madness going on. And, you know, um, we're distributing labels, you're releasing stuff. So you do stuff. And things like the Biorhythm albums, I mean, the way the music and the way they're presented, I mean, they're absolutely from the heart, you know, I mean, the, the quality is always there. No way was that an attempt to make money. I mean, if you made me on it, that was, that was great, but he was, he was releasing music. And the same with the new group albums and, and loads of stuff we put out. But you, it, it's a, it is a bit odd when, as I say, I mean, Network was what, 88, no, Cork at 88. Really, you're talking about a period of 88 to 96. It's a long time ago. And I, you know, we do things at uh, Cafe Artem at Office Social Club. We do a gig there once a month. You talk to people, they come up and go, Did you release so and so? Or I remember buying this and they didn't release that. And then it just, I mean, it's just astonishing, you know. I mean, I can understand an artist getting that credit because they've created the music for, for, for a label thing. I mean, it's just like, Well, yeah, we did the design, he did the artwork, they did the distribution. I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit silly there when I say that. But I mean, it, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's great. I just love it, you know. I mean, and we've got, uh, to answer your question about uh, any pressure now we're just releasing stuff we put out reissue uh, uh, Inner City Alternate sorry not Alternate Next 21 Slow Motion Rhythm on the Loose uh, Biorhythm Derek May Innovator LP um, and there's some new artists some new material on the Biorhythm album and it's been quite good because um, our distributors above board and they were basically obviously thinking, well, you need some help. He was like, do you want someone to do the artwork? No. Do you want someone to do the press releases? No. Do you want someone to add art? No. And I think they'd be quite surprised by how, how good stuff is, you know? Um, so, 
I, I, I'm not sort of... With a heritage of, like that, how, how is it going to be anything less? Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. And as I say, I, I'm not being um, modest, for the, falsely modest. I mean, I, what we did was amazing, and I know that. But it, it is... Um, it's really heartening when people come back and say, oh, I love that record. And sometimes it's it's a remix or something like, you know, do you remember that remix? And you go, yeah, okay. And yeah, I love that and whatever. I mean, just just magical days, really. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, listen, I am going to... Uh, how are you both doing for time? Are you okay? Can I, can I yeah. steal your attention for a little longer? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. yeah. so what I'm going to do, I'm going to avert my attention to some of these comments uh, and I'll read them. Uh, and if there's anything springs to mind, you can uh, share it. I'm just, I'm just disappearing for two minutes. Okay, no problem. So, uh, no, Colin, you, I'll direct these. To... We'll, we'll, we'll talk about um, my affiliation with my old friend, Mr. Dave Lee. Okay. He used to be called, used to be called Mr. Joey Negro. There you we go. We used to talk on the phone back in the 80s when Dave, Dave I think Dave, was he start DJing or collecting in about 78 so I, by that time I'd been doing it for um, since 67 so there's there's 11 years gap there but we, we always got on very well and um, you know got back with him more recently he's worked for me at the Vibe event but also I signed with his label and I've done two of the Jazz Fusion compilations for him I've got a new double double album coming out uh, on February the 4th next year through Zed Records um, and when he originally spoke to me, he asked me to do um, a compact that deserved to be on vinyl as opposed to just on digital and a soul compilation. But I think they found it so difficult to try and license those tracks properly. In the end, if, if you remember Dave's logo for his label, it's, it's, it's a house music label, a dance label. So not jazz. So for him to allow me to put out two jazz compilations and now a third one, both the first two compilations sold out every copy of vinyl. Uh, and this time, rather than even concentrate on the CD, there will be a CD, but every track will be on, on vinyl. So two double albums coming out in February the 4th next year. I've just done a project with, um, with Giles Peterson, one of his uh, latest bands, Protégés, with the connection with uh, Bluey from Incognito, who goes back all the way uh, to the jazz funk scene with uh, Parisian Girl, all those great records they made in those early days, and also Light of the World played at one of Neil's old days, so Bear and Blackpool back in the day. Um, but this band, Strata, uh, Giles asked me to get some remixes done, which I've done, some fantastic guys on the remix. You can buy that from me by just PMing me on Facebook, uh, I've already done about 200 this week, uh, just sending them out myself. So now I'm a, an even more hardworking DJ. Have <laughs> you sent my copy out, Colin? <laughs> no, yeah, I sent it out. Yes, uh, not today. <laughs> You'll have it tomorrow. Yes, I did. Right, I I'm, trying, I'm trying to go back and read all of these comments, but uh, it goes back so far now. Um, uh, we got Dave first around the corner listening. Lisa Crampton, Steve Reed, uh, who only just recently, you, uh, Mr. Blackwax has only recently met you, Colin, said you can't believe that. Rob Adams also mentioning number sevens. Matt Blythe, uh, as he loved the conversation, um, as has, there was so much. Stephen Seymour was saying, sh nice shout out for Jonathan, giving Rock City a mention. Uh, Lynn Spencer, uh, sorry, um, a lot of the younger generation are now loving soul music because their parents introduced them to it. Uh, Lynn says she took her girls to listen to Colin when she was 14 and she's 37 now. So continuing uh, <laughs> continuing the legacy. Fernando as well, uh, a great dance dance. Schoolboy is listening. Simon Schoolboy Phillips, who's loved... Uh, catching and listening to you two legends talk and forgive me to anybody else that I didn't actually get around to mentioning. Um, it's incredible. And I did ask you when we were lining up this interview, if you feel, do you feel you've, you've told your life story in one, um, in one interview at any, at any point down the years, Colin, would you say your story is correctly documented uh, up until no, sort of like no, this no, point? No, 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 no. The, 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 the thing is with, with, with documenting uh, the UK, I mean, we, we, we very sadly got very few photographs of, of, of 
the first 30 years of this that Neil and I experienced. And, you know, and now you can go out and take 200 photographs in one night. Mm-hmm. We don't have 200 photographs of, of, of the previous 20 years, uh, not 200 good photographs. Um, you know, photography was too expensive. Uh, it didn't happen. But, I, yeah, there's been stories told about me, but I, I'm currently writing a book. It's hard work. Uh, even more hard work than uh, is that why you pulled out all of those um, pieces of paper that you were sharing with me photographs of your your dear mother's handwriting of uh, mailing list subscribers and the likes tell us about that well well, well, back back in those days the communication was the telephone and um, and and, you know because I I, I have a disorganised brain uh, I come up with it with the end product, but if anybody was to look at the workings out, you know, they'd, they'd be confused that I was ever going to come up with anything. But my mother used to keep a log of, of people who, who'd rung me and, and take the bits of paper and put, enter them all into the book. So I've still got those books. I've still got all, I've still got Neil's original phone numbers. I've still got original phone numbers from everybody way back to probably 1970. It's incredible when you um, showed it to me. It blew me away. Addresses, uh, and, and, phone and, numbers, know, different, postcodes. Different guys. I mean, one of the London DJs, Rog Selly, I, I sent him some pictures of, of notes I'd made about his shows. He couldn't believe it. Yeah, because for me, it isn't just about what I see, what I view. I'm, I mean, I'm like Neil. I, I'll make my decision as to what I like and what I don't like. But I like to take on board other people's viewpoints and, you know, and that goes back in this conversation, goes back to Birmingham, goes back to Graham Moore, goes back to Sean Williams and the run on it. You take on other people's viewpoints as well. You take on and, and, and you know, listen to what they've got to say. And I used to go around physically and listen to different DJs that I'd heard about or I wanted to hear because I'd come away and learn something. And and so when I played at the on the old day scene, I didn't just know what was happening with me. I knew what was happening in Sheffield, Leicester, Birmingham, Manchester. I, I got an advantage on a lot of people. that I knew the breakout records in those cities so I could bring them all together on the other day. I was just about to ask you, what is it that you would learn from a DJ, the way they would put the records together or how they would jump from one star to another or just an artist you'd not heard of before? You, 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 t- you took... Um, you, you took one of the examples early on when you talked about technology. When technology came in and the mixing came in, that wasn't my forte. I, I'm, I'm, I, I try and be black and white, you know. And I, I remember some young guys coming up, some mixed guys. They, 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 you know, they were bedroom mixer guys who DJed when I was playing at Blackburn, and they said you're now being termed as the Antichrist because of the way you play records. You just chop them up, you just cut them around. They they loved it. They absolutely couldn't believe it, you know, because they'd grown up on mixing everything perfectly and the beat had to be this. But I'm taking it from 124 down to bloody 90, just like that. Nobody, and, and that moment you watch people's faces and you watch that reaction to that musical change. And I've watched some great DJs do that. I've watched Spinner do it. I've watched, you know, great DJs do that sometimes. And when you, because I, I'm, I've got this musical heritage and musical mixture, I can do that and get away with it. And, and, and I do get away with it. If your timing is right, that has much more impact than clever mixing. So for me, programming first, mixing is, is something that I've learned to do a little bit better on, on digital, but mixing two records together, yeah, that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, not yeah. vinyl, anyway. I don't Good know where Neil's different. gone. Neil, have we lost you or you just turned your camera off slot temporarily? <laughs> no, I think I'm having a problem. I'll uh, try and sort it. Okay, no worries. Um, so, so, so going to listen to other DJs, I'm going to, yes. We, we got you, back Neil. Back in those days. I'm back. Back, yeah. back in those days particularly, uh, yeah, they may play a different track off an album, which was the case with... Uh, with, with Graham, for instance, I mean, Graham took the Roy Ayers album and he played Sweet Tears. No one else in any club was playing Sweet Tears at that time, the track. And then wow. years later, of course, Louis did Sweet Tears on the New Yorkan album. So it, it, it's just these people connect, whether you go back to 70s arrangers and producers, some of the great ones there, Ashford and Simpson and Leon Pendarvis and you know Sam Dees, all these great writers, arrangers and producers. And then that respect was paid by Louis Vega, Masters at Work, to all the, you know, to the Royers, to the Jocelyn Browns, mm-hmm. and, you know, and bringing back raw talent and representing it. And, and that's what 
that's the skill that Neil's got. Neil's yeah. got that skill. Well, you actually, with Susu, Neil, uh, with Susu, you released uh, a master, you did a, a, a few licenses, released an album, didn't you? Was it Susu that released the album or was yeah, it at the same yeah. time? Uh, with, 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 uh, um, Our time guys. is coming. Yeah, and Everton Webb, well known, mm-hmm. Brummy, deserves the credit for that. What happened was that uh, I'd worked on um, Knights of the Jaguar, um, D- um, used techno record, uh-huh. DJ Rondo, and um, uh, yeah, which was there was Knights of the Jaguar, Trins Alive, and then later Blackwater Octave One. So I think I worked on three of the best records. Anyway, Octave One. We kind of do, wanted to do a deal. It's still in the UK. I know it's black water. I'm talking rubbish here. I basically worked on Nights of Jaguar. It came out via Octave One's label for some crazy stuff, 430 West. And I basically started working with Lenny Lawrence and we made black water. And um, my claim to fame on that one, the, the, the version with the strings, the live strings, that was me saying, let's not spend the money on a remix. Let's just do live strings. Anyway, from that, I started working for Concept. Uh, um, I, I told you, I licensed the record to They basically said, why don't you run our label? So I said, well, I will if I own it or whatever. And they didn't give me that. <laughs> but the, the the first thing that happened was that it was complete great timing. We got we got Blackwater about to drop and I was now working with the company and I'd also licensed the record to them. Typical me, you know, doing all things to all men. And we started the label and Everton, who again is one of the heroes of black music in, in Birmingham, um, I'd known him from uh, Concept. Sorry, I'd known him from the early days of Cool Cat, and then he went to Big Life, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he was really friends with the lady, Rosie, Rosie Lopez, who worked at Tommy Boy Records. And he found out that Tommy Boy had imploded. And the Masters of Work album was supposed to come out via Warner Brothers in the UK, and it couldn't come out. And we were just in the position to, um, to know about it, and we basically licensed a record. I think people like... Um, there were a lot of labels were after it. We moved really quickly and got it for, you know, pay, pay good money, but not enough fortune. So, yeah, our first release was Our Time Is Coming. And then from that, I did the Backfired uh, single. And the funny thing on that is that Kenny and Louie, basically they didn't want a 12-inch coming out, which was a bit cheeky because they'd done the deal with Tommy Boy. You know what I mean? And we did the 10-inch. And if you remember that 10-inch with the badges on, mm-hmm. and I did 10,000. Well, we did 10,000 of that. It was like crazy. And from that, I did the Louis Vega album um, for um, Louis Vega for Soul Heaven mm-hmm. and um, loads of great singles. Then we did the South Pod album. So um, Joe Clausel, Blaze, Dimitri from Paris, Jazzy B, Quentin Harris, uh, Kenny Dope, I think. And it, 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 amazing, you know, um, Giles Peterson. And uh, that was good fun. And it was um, it was interesting for me from my perspective in the early 2000s dealing with these people because um, I thought a lot of them thought they were bigger stars than they they really are you know I mean we're all in <laughs> we're really everyone just a little satellite on around this you know the, big the big, big fish in a little pond basically yeah well also I mean there, there were some of the things that went on were just crazy you know. And at that stage, the DJ stroke producer ego and madness costed by completely ridiculous agents and managers. It got ridiculous, you know. I mean, one of the albums, I won't mention the names, it was an expensive album. Um, one of the other DJs sent an irate fax, I think it was fax in those days or whatever, email, saying you can't use the photo of the other DJ, I'll hate it. It's going, well, he supplied it, you know. <laughs> it, it was it was that stupid, you know. Um, yeah. Well, uh, Lisa Crampton, who's been listening intently all the way through this day, she asked if I wouldn't mind asking you guys who you believe in your circles will continue to fly the flag uh, for years to come. And also, uh, to coin a phrase, new kids on the block who inspire you uh, nowadays, who moving forward, you, you think will we spoken about in high esteem as yourselves are in 30, 40 years time. I don't know about new kid on the block, but I, 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 <laughs> your, your ex-partner, Timmy Vegas. I mean, I know he's not a new kid on the block. Have, have you heard the stuff he's doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It, well, I've heard stuff really he stuff. has done. I mean, he's, he's a very broken individual. So from, from a broken individual always comes brilliance, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we're releasing, um, uh, him and um, Matt have done a under the Soul City got Soul Central guys 
doing a remix of Barbara Pennington 24 hours a day, and it's very much in that Jamichi from Paris, Joan Agravain. But I tell you what, the work they put into it, it was just mind-blowing. Um, Nick, I, I'm, I'm more like these days, I, I, I look at Juno list every week and I'll, I'll buy six records. I'll, I'll, and if you ask me to name, you know, eight great artists, I, Colin could do it, but I, I can't really do that, you know. No. Uh, I, buy, I buy new records all the time. Okay. Um, um, but, Colin, uh, would you like to, in, anyone spring to mind there who, who, who struck you as being sort of like on the verge of greatness or already attained greatness and has a longevity in front of them? D- DJ wise, uh, DJ producer. Well, D- D- well, one, one, one of the blokes, and this is a guy that um, I heard about, and then I listened to his stuff as he started to put it out, and he was he was recognised by King Street Records in the states, and he sits in a, in his house uh, with more keyboards than uh, the Fen- the Rhodes Factory, and he's, he's taught himself how to play so many instruments. But for me, a massive talent is Sean McCabe. Uh, an absolutely massive, massive talent. And he's coming to Birmingham. Uh, we, we're all coming to Birmingham on December the 18th for the Powerhouse Revival. I'm playing in all four rooms, so you'll be able to judge me against whoever these people are. But Sean McCabe, um, it, it's difficult to break through. It, it, it's because it isn't just one scene anymore. You know, I mean, uh, you know, my reputation comes from you know through Northern Soul, through a system that doesn't exist anymore, and that's the residency. The residency, a club residency, where you build a framework of records and you also build trust and you also build a family of people. That doesn't exist for me anymore. I, I, you know, it, it must exist for, for, for other people, but I don't see it in, in my day-to-day life. I'm sure it's out there, but you know, a, a, a club where everybody goes every week, no. is, is that still out there? No. You know, it, 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 that's you know that was the golden torch. That was the twisted wheel. That was Blackpool Mecca. That was Rafters in Manchester. That was Rum Runner in Birmingham. You know, th- that's that's what that's why we're talking about this history still because the glue that 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 held all that together you know, has been passed down and passed down. What what the next thing is? Who knows? Because there's so many options and there's so many people in in it for different reasons nowadays it's it's difficult for me to uh, to select it but sean mccabe sean is somebody who who uh, you know has got the skills i mean i mean i've had him i've had groove assassin uh, you know i like i like sean alley out of chicago he's a brilliant dj producer but dj's producers and, and we've just touched on that this this has been a new era hasn't it where djs have become the music makers mm-hmm I grew up in an era where artists were the music makers uh, and it's two completely different worlds, two completely different worlds. I'm not saying that one music is better than another, but it is two completely different worlds. You're working and, and, and again, I go back to Birmingham. I, I go back to the Odeon in Birmingham when I saw Denise Williams sing and on the night she was singing, the compare came out and said, we're very sorry, but the first act hasn't shown up, but we've got some bloke called Lenny Williams instead. So I watched Lenny Williams and Denise Williams in the same night. And this guy went on, of course, with Tower of Power and all these other phenomenal bands. And, you know, and, and, and I was there when Earth, Wind and Fire played live in Manchester this time with Santana. And they came on first and 20 minutes into the Santana set, most people had left wow. and they'd all come to see Santana. Earth, Wind and Fire came on stage with a mixture of magic and music that none of us had experienced. This is in Bellevue. It's not there anymore. But, but thanks, Neil. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Easy for you to say. Um, but but the, 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 drummer was, the, drummer, the drummer was the drummer was spinning around 360. The, the whole act, the magic, the levitation, Parliament came into the country oh. live and played Bellevue. They went on for four hours. We had Parliament, we had the Brides of Funkenstein, we had Parlet, <coughs> we had Funkadelic, all on the same bill. And also at that, that same venue, I, I don't know if this is with, with Birmingham programme, but again on that same venue, and Neil's mentioned this guy as well, Barry White Live. You can't do that if you're a DJ producer. You can't be Barry White Live. Barry White Live was phenomenal. Love Unlimited Orchestra kicked it off. And we had all these incredible instrumentals before Barry came on stage. But this guy, 
in the days before radio mics, walked around the whole auditorium with guys coming behind him with the, with the, with the, the cable. cable. You can see a little bit of this. I think there was a concert in London at the same time. But so this, it's difficult to predict what will happen next. And another good guy that is no longer with us, and Neil's mentioned him, is, is, is Mick, um, who, who was, was one of the best PR men in the UK, Mick Clark. But he started off in, uh, in City Sounds Records with Johnny... And I used to go down there as well. They had a you know a pouch in there for Robbie Vincent, and they gave me a pouch, which was fantastic. In those days, Pete Tong had a pouch in there. City City Sounds Records, and uh, yeah, you know, you Mick know, Clark, Colin, Mick it's Clark it's went went. Sorry, this is actually you know before City Sounds went for Tony Munson. Yes. And, and well, you know, well you know, I, 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 I I I discovered. T- I discovered Tony Monson's shop on the King's Road when yeah, he started yeah. in imp- when he started importing Japanese yeah, jazz. We were there. Yeah, that was, you yeah. know, I, because that was co- some of it was coming up to spin him, but I quickly realised that everything wasn't coming to Manchester yeah. or Birmingham. So I used to go down to the King's Road and uh, and, and, yeah. al- and also Andy with the Birmingham connection. I mean, Mick Clark did a lot of stuff with the Erskine Thompson. Erskine okay. C. Yeah, you actually said that like, you wanted to give a, a, a mention yeah, to Erskine. Yeah, I mean, he was, um, you know, one of the first Birmingham guys to sort of, you know, be involved in the in the with the record labels and stuff. Ended up managing Loose Ends and Maxi Priest. He had, he had the radio show on Social on BRMB, didn't he? I think. Late 70s. Mm-hmm. I think I was trying to get... To, yeah, and Erskine was great. And Erskine was just, I don't know, you talk about flying the flag for Birmingham. He was he was original flag waver, you know. Um, and I well, don't, I don't, the strong don't, radio connections as well. You, you got you got that you got that through the dance though as well. I mean, you know, Birmingham Lacona, where where you got the first dance style, the jazz dance style, which was called balletic. Uh, yeah, you know, we've talked about Lancelot. We've talked about uh, you know Rick and Ty, the twins, and. You know, the guys who came out of that. But then we had a second wave with Malcolm Stretch, Patrick and Gilly. Gilly is still involved in music from Birmingham. You know, these guys brought the, brought the step in. They, they took the, the, the step in jazz steps down to London and, and fused together the horseshoe and fused together an electric ballroom. Mm-hmm. And, and there's another phenomenon. You know, George Power, who's no longer with us, the Crackers Club. Who used to used to bring people, you know, people that would come from Crackers uh, with Cleveland Anderson, uh, you know, to Manchester, to Birmingham. Uh, you've got that whole connection with Paul Trouble Anderson as well, and and and, and so, you know, as well as as well as the music, as well as the uh, you know the artists that Neil's talking about, Birmingham definitely is is on the map for 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 the individual dance styles that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, at times, uh, house music has taken that away, where people just stand there waving the phones at the DJ. Yeah, I know. What's that all well, about? I've got What's to thank you about? for your professionalism for bringing it back around to the Birmingham topic, because uh, it would be so very easy to sit here and and talk. Well, not talk. Listen to the stories that you guys have got to share. Um, but uh, I'd like to touch on this again at some point and, and have another conversation with you uh, whenever down the line, uh, talk about other projects that you've got going on. Um, Neil, do you feel that we covered all of the essential parts uh, in a, a, a short a time as possible? Yeah. I'll tell you one of the points I'd, I'd make, like we were talking before we went on air. I think you, you, you talk you ask about being interviewed, forget me, me being interviewed, but I think we think about Birmingham and the Midlands and the North. I think, the history of, of 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 that as again to London centric music scene in interviews and what's it it's often completely ignored. Totally, um, totally. You know, I mean, as I mean, someone as expert as Eddie Pillar, who I love. I, I was interviewing Eddie a few weeks, a few months ago on his radio station. I was starting to show on the stage, so I love Eddie, and he said in all seriousness that uh, the jazz song thing was the Essex phenomenon, and that he d- did understand that Colin. And Colin Curtis and Ian Levine were playing jazz funk. Well, Ian Levine wouldn't play jazz funk if he gave a million pounds. But for someone like Eddie, who is a clever guy not to know about the history of the whole jazz funk thing, which grew, grew from the Northern Soul thing in a way, you know, and then also the way that jazz funk movement sort of metamorphized to what Colin was on about. And then I think the early, the early UK house scene grew from that. I mean, when I was aware of house music in 80, 86, whatever, I mean, I, I was I, I wasn't out DJing and stuff, but I, I knew about the records, and it was all based on that 
what was going on, you know. And I, I think the history of house music, I mean, this Balearic thing and, um, you know, Danny Ramplin and Oakenfold going to Ibiza and discovering this magic Alexa. I mean, to be honest, you look at the early <laughs> records from Sheffield, it's our rock is unique through the theme. That 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 was that was that was, that was that they were listening to records from Chicago and Detroit and doing their own version of it and that was part of that whole you know not north of London that was it nightmares and wax Rob Adams is saying I, 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 I would say I would say at that time the jazz funk scene in Manchester Birmingham Nottingham Leeds Bradford Huddersfield was much bigger and Scotland I'll bring in on that. And Carlisle and Newcastle upon Tyne was much bigger than what was going on in London. But like history books, people only want to talk about what's going on in London because that's where the record companies are. That's where that's where the central is. Don't get me wrong, brilliant things have come out of London. But I don't think that that the Midlands and the Northwest and, and Scotland as well. I don't think it gets um, it, it's it's due. Well, uh, well, between it's, you it's guys... Weird, it's, weird that, it's, it's weird, though, that's happened because there's been enough correct information being told over the years for, for the misinformation not to be repeated. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you, know, you guys yeah, will I mean, put that right. You won't let it lie now. And with Colin's book on the horizon, do you have any serious um, forecasts as to when that's going to materialise, Colin? Well, yeah, well, you've just used the word horizon. You never get there, do you? I, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it's, it's now about... I don't know, 150 down the line. But, I mean, I've, I've tried to break it up into the clubs. I've, I've then have to break it up into, um, you know, what we've talked about, you know, the different genres that, that have developed that, that I'm aware enough to talk about. Um, you know, there's areas that I can't talk about in any great depth. I was I was affected by hip-hop, but I'm, not, I'm no expert. I was affected by electronic, uh, you know, the bombarders. And I'm, again, I'm no expert. But I'm an expert in in certain fields. Yeah, I'll be talking about all them. But then I also want to put the the, the pictures, the the, the images of the record labels in there. And, you know, that's slowed down by licensing and permissions and all the rest of it. But I want to put a lot of that in there, you know, the the way that they, uh, you know, the way that that conveys to people memories and conveys to people, you know, the the tangible side of, of vinyl where, you know, I used to learn from, I used to discover artists by pulling out the album as well as looking at who was playing on the album inside to be an inner sleeve with maybe 20 albums on each side. That's how I discovered artists like Azar Lawrence. That's how I discovered artists like Patrice Russian. She was recording for prestige records back in those days. She became a big R and B star, but she was essentially a jazz artist. Gene Kahn, you know, on black jazz records, it became a, a you know a, a great Philadelphia singer. But she, her and Doug Kahn were putting together unbelievable jazz albums before that, and and you know the same way that you know the, the, I was playing, you know the last poets at Blackpool Mecca, on Douglas Records in 1977, but you know and and a lot of the things that got picked up in London later and, and and they get they get the they got the credit for that. I'm not saying I want the credit for it, but like Neil says, it'd be nice that when people do know the truth, that the truth is spoken, not just pushed away or glossed over. And I'm and I'm not on the bandwagon here to you know to to, uh, to push that side of it. But yeah, you know, when you've been involved and you know how people have developed, you know when things have gone on, that, that it'd be nice to see it done properly. So I will make an effort, but the whole music scene is a parallax view. It depends where you're standing. It depends what you've experienced. If you go to a football match and, and sit in the stand, you will have a different opinion than the bloke who's down on the terrace. You know, there will be different viewpoints, different viewpoints depending also on what team you support. So I'm trying to encompass a balance into the book as well, not just, you know, because I'm looking at it from behind the decks what people see from the other side of the decks, from the dance floor, from people who just come along to, to, to enjoy or just, just to listen. You know, there's different views. So I'm trying to talk to people. I like Snowboy's book. I liked his book. He went out and spoke to so many people. It took him 10 years to compile it, you know, because he's getting other people's viewpoints. Then he's trying to play off when there's a conflict. He's trying to trying to flatten that out a little bit. So... Yeah, a, a combination. I've, I've already spoken to Neil once. I'll need to speak to him again. Uh, it's it's difficult because you also talk to somebody who, who remembers something that you've forgotten, and you then you want to incorporate that. 
But I wouldn't change anything. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change anything. No, no. Not not for the fame. Not for anything. I, I I'm still doing what I did in in the 1960s, and that's get excited about what's coming next and being able to share it with other people. And long you know, I, may it continue, I say. You know, I think, Colin, one of the things that you, I think you said this to me before in the book, you're going to emphasize the camaraderie that was around, aren't you? I mean, because there was the, a lot the, of the, 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 camar- no, the camaraderie that, 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 has, that has, you know, come back uh, from from 60s soul, 70s soul, the camaraderie on, on our scene, the camaraderie that was built up through your events at the Ritz and events in Birmingham at the Locarno, uh, you know, some of these guys have been dancing for nearly 50 years, dancing for nearly 50 years and still dancing. The camaraderie that moved on with the house scene, um, the camaraderie that developed at, at Southport Weekender, which became, in everybody's opinion, the greatest weekender in the world. When you look what we've done in the UK, when we look what we've achieved, Northern Soul is now probably the most collectible music in the whole of the world. But, the reason it was exposed is because of working class people in the UK. It's American music. We're not trying to steal that, but we're sharing it in the UK. And now it's, you know, if you'd have invested a hundred thousand pounds in the seventies in Northern soul records, as Neil has said, you'd be, you'd have made more money than diamonds or gold. The soul music culture, the jazz funk culture, the jazz dance culture, which spread to Japan and all over the world. It came from the UK. The success of DJs like Vega and, and, and the whole Masters at Work thing. The UK drove that. The UK drove it. The UK exposed that music and, 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 and pushed it all over the world because of the interest you know, that, that, that was put in the UK. I don't think I'm wrong on any of those points. I mean, I've, I've no, watched the developer. No, I know all the all. players. What were you going to say now? And, 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 and I, I think that, you know, when you say what's coming next, I'm sure what's coming next will start in the UK, <laughs> um, even if the artists themselves or the DJs aren't from the UK. Yeah. No, but I, it's I fantastic. Say- I mean, what, what the internet's done is made me realise that, you know, that you can now get to people. I mean, my, my shows have been downloaded. My radio shows and podcasts have been downloaded in over 140 countries now. I couldn't <laughs> achieve that. I couldn't have achieved that back in the day. I'm actually well, I'm amazed great. at your passion, your drive and your oh. commitment to the sound. Neil, 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 Neil knows about that. Neil, you know, people who get close to me understand that. I mean, I mean if you think back to the old days, I mean, at the peak of the old day scene, I may be doing three old days in one day. So people would probably turn me arrogant or ignorant. They are in and play my set and then go. Um, but people have got to know me better and, and people who've got close to me know what the passion is. My passion is the same as it was in the, in the early 1960s when I had to get to the record shop to get, whether it was the Spencer Davis group, whether it was the Temptations, whether it was the four tops, whatever it was, whatever the record was, I had to have it the very next day or within 24 hours of hearing it. And that's never changed. That's never changed. I don't want it to change. Mental. Neil, let's have some final words from yourself because I need to start wrapping this up. I think. Okay, now I was going to give it a side talk about, Colin talking about Rare Northern Soul Records. The, the, the very rarest copy, the rarest record is Frank Wilson, Do I Love You? It's sold for about £105,000. And connecting all the dots, Kevin Saunderson tried to buy that off Ron Murphy for me. After the Reese Project, Inner City both had five number ones in the Billboard dance charts and the Record Mirror dance charts. And he said he wanted to buy me a present. And we were driving from Chicago to Detroit, big old fashioned mobile. And Kevin went up to $5,000. And I said, it's not worth any more. Don't, don't bother, mate. I should have said, <laughs> carry on, shouldn't I? I should have said, <laughs> 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 Oh, brilliant! Well, gentlemen. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I mean you, you talk you talk about rare records. One, one of another one of the rarest records was the Inspirations, of course, Neil, which which you got. I think where, where did you get that from? I mean, you 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 kind of sold or loaned that to me at Blackpool Mecca. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk it, Bob, it, Bob Cataneo. Bob Cataneo, yeah. And then uh, but I, it, I almost it, I it, almost it, got killed with Bill Baker, the by Joey Jefferson, at his LA base four years later when I. Temerity to 
remind him that he told me to sell his record. You know, that's that's another story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's lot, another story. Of, we've got a thousand. We've got a thousand other stories, and yeah. the only reason I want to bring these to a close is for the simple fact that I think two hours. Well, I'll I'll, I'll I'll finish my bit with Roy Ayers. Go on then. Yeah. Roy Ayers. Roy Ayers. If I go, it's because I'm losing power. If I disappear, that's why. Yeah, okay. Right? Roy, okay. Ayers, Roy Ayers. Roy Ayers at Blackpool Mecca, booked by Neil. I think it was January '78. Was it? It was the um, snowiest, the snowiest, yeah, the all snowiest time, right? day ever, and we couldn't get we couldn't get him off the stage. We had to get one of those hooks that they use at the Apollo to get him off the stage. Yeah. He wasn't going to stop. But when I spoke to him in the dressing room, I took about eight of his albums and he signed them for me very kindly. And he said, "You know what, Colon? Because Colin isn't a name in the states, but Colon sounded good. I took it." He said, "You know what, Colon? If you didn't buy so many records, you could own a yacht." And I said. Roy, I live in Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> I couldn't be further away from any water or needing a yacht. I'll carry on buying records. <laughs> Wonderful. And on that note, before Neil's battery dies, I want to officially yeah. bid you both for a while. Thank, okay. thank you. Thank you for thank your you time. I'm going to say goodbye to the people watching. Colin, the, the utmost respect and thanks go out to you, my friend. Uh, our paths have only just really crossed. Um, your legacy will live on forever. Thank you for taking time out to talk to me. I truly, truly appreciate it's it, my friend. It's been, a pleasure to do it. it's been a pleasure to do it with someone I've got the utmost respect for and, and has been involved. You know, I mean, this is the guy we used to play football in the park opposite his, and then we'd go for, for a meal. And Neil always paid because he knew I wouldn't have enough money to pay. Um, <laughs> right. but, but it was... You know, what, what, what he's done and achieved, and, and, and he is a modest guy, but what he's done and achieved and the other areas he's got into that, that I've, I've never been involved in, uh, you know, phenomenal. Uh, he right. is a phenomena. And again, you know, like, like Alex Lowe's, a phenomena. Neil, you and I will talk at length. We have a long history ourselves, a very long history. And uh, I appreciate you taking, taking time to talk to us. And when we continue these conversations, I will definitely be bringing you back on to talk to other of our Birmingham counterparts. Uh, so thank you, my friend. Thank you so thank very much. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay. okay. Thank you. I love you both. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care, pal. No problem. Okay, so there they go. I, I, I don't know what to say. I absolutely don't know what to say. Thank you to everybody that's uh, here with me. Um, we've had a, quite a few people passing through. Lots of comments, lots of shares. Uh, and at the end of all these talks, I have my access symbol at the top of the screen and all these names at the bottom. These are the people who are responsible for allowing me to do these talks. They uh, fund me um, with a, a monthly subscription. And so I just wanted to give them some recognition, all these names scrolling along the bottom. Thank you to all of those guys. Thank you to all of you. Mr. Smooth, what's happening, rude boy? Paul Mack giving us some congratulations to Maurice, to Lynn, to John, Jane, Aisha, uh, everybody else. Again, uh, I'm sure you will have been aware I was sitting listening without wanting to interrupt too much, without wanting to... Uh, uh, bother the gentleman with uh, comments I was reading. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Carol. Uh, and again, a lot of people will be coming back and watching this recording. I do a lot of these talks every Tuesday evening, at 7 p.m. Uh, alternate Tuesdays. One week it will be Inspire and Be Inspired, which could be uh, a number of different topics of conversation. And then also every other week, the Soulful House Mafia, where we will focus on the Soulful House movement, usually around the mid 90s, uh, up until recent times. Next Tuesday, 7 p.m. It's a big one. Another big one. I mean, I don't think it's ever going to get bigger than tonight, but I'll be talking to Aaron Ross and Neil Pierce. And they'll be telling us their individual stories and they'll also be telling us their joint stories because they've got a, uh, a joint story to tell and they've also got individual stories to tell. I'm a big part of some of their stories, so I'm going to be interesting uh, to I am going to be interested to listen to what they've got to say. Uh, all of these people on the screen you can see who are now following the page and have liked the video. Thank you so much to Anil, to Jeff, Mark, uh, Janet, to Carl Barrington Webster. 
Good evening, sir. Much respect to you. Uh, Matt, to Lee, Morris as well. Um, thank you all. I will um, leave it there. And if you haven't yet liked the page, please do uh, leave a like uh, and be sure to come back and follow us. Enjoy the rest of Tuesday evening. Don't forget, next Tuesday, Aaron Russ, Neil Pierce, Soulful House Mafia. You be good now. Where do I press my button? This one. I'm out of here.